Good evening. It is 6.30. Uh, meeting notice. Adequate notice of this meeting of the Berkeley Heights Board of Education was given as required by the Open Public Meetings Act as follows. Notice of this special Board of Education meeting was sent to the Star Ledger and the Courier News on April 22nd, 2024, and was provided to all schools, PTO presidents, BHEA president, and posted at the administration building. A copy was also provided to the public library and filed with the municipal clerk. Please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Secretary, may we have a roll call, please? Bradford. Here. Dr. Borger. Here. Mr. Hyman. Ms. Jolly. Here. Ms. Karna. Here. Ms. Penna. Mrs. Stanley. Here. We have a quorum. Adjourn to executive session. Whereas the Berkeley Heights Board of Education seeks to adjourn to executive session in full compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA, 10 colon 4 dash 6 and whereas the open public meeting app provides that a public body may exclude the public from that portion of the meeting at which it discusses matters related to those identified below. Matters rendered confidential by federal law, state law, or court rule individual privacy, collective bargaining agreements, purchase or lease of real property if public interest could be adversely affected, investment of public funds if public interest could be adversely affected, tactics or techniques utilized in protecting public safety and property, pending or anticipated litigation, attorney-client privilege, personnel employment matters affecting specific prospective or current employees. Be it resolved that the Berkeley Heights Board of Education adjourns to executive session to discuss matters related to personnel and attorney-client privilege, and be it further resolved that the minutes of the discussion, if any of these items will be disclosed to the public when matters have been determined and confidentially, confidentiality is no longer applicable. May I have a motion to enter into executive session? Second. Thank you. It is 634. Okay, we're going to move to executive session. I move to return from executive session. Seconded. Second. Thank you. Public, we thank you for your uh, patience as we had an extra long executive meeting today. So thank you very much for your patience at this time. All right, so return to public session, 823. We're gonna begin our budget presentation and public discussion. So Mr. Nixon and Mr. Juskowitz, thank you. All right, good evening, everybody, and uh, I'd like to echo Mrs. Bradford's uh, thanks. We appreciate your patience as we've navigated through some components this evening. Uh, my name is Robert Nixon. I'm the acting superintendent of schools as well as the principal at Governor Livingston High School. Joining me for this presentation tonight uh, will be our assistant superintendent, Dr. Giordano, as well as Mr. Juskowitz, our school business administrator and board secretary. Um, so as as an introduction to our presentation this evening, uh, I'd, I'd like to just re remind everybody that we are guided in this district by our strategic plan. Um, so as we consider uh, the aspects of our budget and the budget development, um, we always like to reference our strategic plan, which has student achievement at the heart of the decisions that we make. Uh, moving through, there were there were five specific goals identified that helped um, guide what we were looking to do as we created the budget. Uh, that was to promote student achievement through the support of educational programs, 
to maintain and upgrade technology in support of district goals, to develop a budget that retains and attracts staff so that we may meet the needs of all of our students, to upgrade facilities, maintain equipment, and enhance security, and to be respectful of the impact on taxpayers. In support of this, we recently asked um, our school community to uh, complete a survey and, and share with us their feedback uh, in some general areas of the budget. Uh, altogether, we had nearly 600 people from our public respond to this. We appreciate that. Um, with fairly even representation between elementary school families, middle school families, and high school families. Um, as we look through this here, we saw that overwhelmingly um, the most important aspect of the budget from the people that responded was teacher investment and, and supporting staff. Um, the, the least of the issue, um, concerns that the public expressed was the, uh, the effort to reduce the tax impact. Overall, we asked if they felt the Board, was, uh, Board of Education is proactive in school community engagement during the budget process. 53% um, said no, 46% uh, said yes. And we asked the public if they felt the Board of Education was transparent in its budget development, and 45% said yes, 55% said no. Um, overall, we were really excited about the level of engagement we felt we had from the community on this. Um, we're, this this data is being used to support us as we get our um, budget to the finish line, so to speak, this year. One of the things we've spoken about um, that we're excited about is engaging the community far earlier in the process next year and utilizing um, information such as this, perhaps much more in depth, um, to help with the creation of the budget at its at its onset, as opposed to uh, at this point. So now to go over some of the specific budget highlights, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Giordano. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Um, so right off the bat, <clears throat> just want to explain to everyone, this budget currently maintains our current staffing levels, our current programs that we currently have in this school year. There's no, right now, there's no staff rifts or layoffs and anything of that nature. In addition to that, we've been able to add a reading specialist to Columbia Middle School, which is woefully needed. Uh, myself, Mr. Kobliska. Now these were, these additional staffings came from, let me take a step back, from when we started the budget process in, 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 uh, in December and January, meeting with the individual principals and the directors and their roles while they were going through, the, while we were budgeting. So this came out of multiple meetings. Um, so these are the recommendations in conjunction with, with our principals and our directors and supervisors. So additional reading specialists um, at Columbia Middle School, currently all elementary schools have a reading specialist, the middle school does not. In my educational opinion, that is a key place where we still need a reading specialist through our sixth through eighth grade students. Um, an addition of a second district athletic trainer, it's not a second district athletic director. It's an athletic trainer. Currently, we only have one. Our sports programs over the years, I'm sure Mr. Nixon as, as building principal can attest to this. Ms. Clifton certainly does, have, have grown. So we have multiple teams in multiple sites, not just on this campus. It's a liability for this district not to have an, an additional athletic trainer at different sites when our sports teams are competing. According to Ms. Clifton, there are teams that will not play against us if we do not have an athletic trainer. So it becomes a scheduling problem when they come to our fields. So that was added to the budget. All things are not equal. We have a single nurse at all of our schools. However, the GL nurse has, I would say almost double, Mr. Nixon will back that up, the student population of everything that's going on in her office. So we felt it was, it was appropriate to, to, to provide a, a 0.5 school nurse at GL for next year. And then, um, with our increase of our, our uh, ELL students, our English language learner students, uh, a current ESL position was increased by 0.15 to make that full time. That person was 0.85, so we're increasing to 0.15. So that's where the additional staffing comes from. And right now, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Jeskowitz to go through the budget highlights a little bit more. Thank you, uh, doc thank you, uh, Dr. Giordano. What I wanted to uh, go through here is uh, the count lines in the budget were compared with prior spending from the last few years. 
Uh, I went through about five years of budget expenditures that determined budget figures in about half the budget. Uh, school budgets and instruction were left to the principals. And from what I had reviewed, they had done an excellent job with their budgets. And I left the instruction part of the budget to the uh, individuals who knew and had done an excellent job of what they did and knew what they were doing. So I left that to their discretion. Um, out of 612 budget lines, 477 have remained flat or decreased, which was about 78%. The Excel budget that I created had that amount of lines and thus how I came up with this uh, calculation. In this budget, the, there was a contractual increase of 3.2% for the BHEA uh, contract. And I believe that contract runs through next year, if I'm not mistaken. There's two more years, sorry. Next is the uh, contractual increase of 3% for the BHAA. And if I believe that's another year, or is that two years? Two years, thank you. Thank you. There was an increase to the bus driver contract for an hourly wage uh, that was increased this past year in order to attract drivers. We we're having a difficult time attracting drivers and we were able to um, be competitive with many of the surrounding districts. Uh, we had an estimated increase in our contribution to the public employees and uh, retirement system is at 18%. Uh, the Business Administrators Association had suggested an increase regarding uh, to the budget for this pension and what the prior actual numbers are from the state. And this is an actuarial uh, estimate. 18% was what the average that came up from these calculated numbers. And thus, the 18% is what's being used in this budget. Property and casualty insurance rates are projected to increase by 10 to 15%. Uh, there are nine different insurance categories, and our broker suggested increases for each category from this range based on market and past claims. Actual numbers come in toward late June, and that's when we'll be getting the actual numbers for these uh, uh, rates. Health benefit and prescription rates are projected uh, to increase by 11%. Our health broker suggested to budget based on claims to date when compiling our budget, when at the time was February, and that was at 11%. Actual numbers will not be determined until all claims have been examined and reviewed. Excuse me. Reviewed and the broker negotiated the final rate when the health benefit company uh, with, with the health benefit company, Cigna. And that will, won't be determined until the end of June. Uh, we have an increase of utilities at 10%. Uh, the increase of utilities was a collaboration of peers and market advisors to determine the percentage increase. Next was the increase of uh, sewer and water of 5%. And that increase of water and sewer was a collaboration also of peers and market advisors to determine this percentage increase and adding that to the budget. The increase in effective uh, school solutions for mental and health services. The increase in this uh, was supported previously by ESSER federal funds, uh, grant funds from previous years. These funds help keep students in the district and needed to be supported by the local budget for uh, this upcoming school year. I'm going to turn the technology highlights over to Dr. Giordano. Super. Thank you, Mr. Jesuits. Uh, good to see everyone again. So these are some of our technology highlights that uh, Mr. Marks and myself, along with uh, Mr. Jesuits, had been working on uh, and, and through this budget process, and we, and we brought Mr. Uh, Nixon up to speed on. Um, as he came on board as the acting superintendent. So we're looking to purchase uh, a more durable uh, Chromebook. They're called HP Fortis Chromebooks. They're a little bit more heavy duty, heavy, they're a little heavy duty. Um, so a little bit more uh, harder for students to damage. 
So um, obviously we're going to start phasing those in. It's not going to be for every single student in the district. We have a, we have a, a plan in place where, you know, we get new uh, Chromebooks every year and we phase the old ones down and, and we start replacing those. Um, secondly, uh, second, we have a, a Google workspace for education plan. Currently we, we use the free Google classroom and Google workspace. This has uh, 75 features for our educators to use, particularly for Mr. Marks and his team. They have enhanced uh, cybersecurity investigation tools that they can use in case we get fished or cyber attacked. It also has an instructional benefit for the teachers. It's going to open up about, um, you know, AI for the Google Classroom with practice problems and feedback. So we're excited about that. Improved digital report cards. I think our parents will be happy about that. Um, it's a plug-in for PowerSchool, which will allow us to securely create a digital report card and then email to the parents as opposed to printing up paper and then mailing them home. And then class link. This is for when we're onboarding uh, new staff members. Currently right now on all the platforms that staff members have access to, we have to, Mr. Marks and his team, I say the royal way, Mr. Marks and his team has to manually plug in their credentials into every platform for every teacher. This class link on sync will be once the new staff member is incorporated into our system, we hit go and it, and it syncs them to everything that we've, we've checked off from them to have access to. So that's what we're looking to do from a technology standpoint. I will turn it back over to Mr. Jeskowitz. Back to Giordano. Now I want to get into the uh, parts of the budget. School tax levy. Uh, we're increasing the school tax levy by just under 2% for next year. Uh, tax levy increase every the, the tax levy increases every year since it supplements the revenues of the district. It is the difference between the appropriations less the revenues of the district. State aid is a component of the revenues of the district. State aid is one of the, the revenue components. The district has received negative state aid, state aid, negative revenue in part due to the high property assessments that have increased over the past few years. The income level has increased also over the past few years, and this has equated to the state stating that the Berkeley Heights has a fair share to support its edu education, and thus why we have received a negative state aid for this past year. Appropriations. We are, I've in in stating earlier before, as we've reduced several of budget lines and also keeping several of them flat, we've tried to reduce um, the overall budget for this past year. Um, in doing so, we've we've decreased appropriations. Comparing funds eleven through thirteen, the budget was reduced by $753,570 from last year. The capital revenue and expenditures of $1,758,750 was removed from the equation and a concerted effort was made to not affect teaching positions for the upcoming budget. This chart shows what, for next year's budget, what salaries and benefits are compared to the rest of the budget for next year. It's 82%, 82.7% versus 17.3%. And basically what the 17.3% is basically uh, uh, services and supplies. And this is basically the proposed operating budget for next year. Classroom instruction is about 48%. Employee benefits at almost 19%. Instructional support is at almost 13%. Operations and maintenance is at 7.6. Transportation is about 4.2%. School administration is 2.5. Business office and technology is at 2%. And gen general admission, general administration is at 3.4%. And that is at, that makes up the 100% of the budget, general budget that is. Uh, a home assessed at $300,000 would see an average, average yearly school tax increase of $135. That average monthly school tax increase would be $11.23 uh, per month. 
uh, $3.74 is what's being assessed at basically at every 100,000 that is assessed. I'm bringing up this, this, chart, this slide here is because this amount of money was what was in capital projects for last year. This amount, this, these projects that are listed here were not basically done this, this past year. The only thing that was done was the remove and replace of the retaining wall. The two projects that are, are up above for the roofing projects, those were not done. And one of the reasons they were not done is because these are being um, partially funded by the state of New Jersey. Uh, we would see 40% of that cost being um, given back to the school district, but the school has to lay the money out first and be reimbursed the 40% of it. One of the reasons why this couldn't have been done is because the state hasn't finished filing the paperwork uh, with giving us that paperwork in order to proceed with the project. Berkeley, not only Berkeley Heights, but many of the other schools, surrounding school districts that are having roof work done we're not able to do their their uh, projects as well. This would not be able to take place until the summer of 20, 2025. So this money will have to go back into our capital reserve and will probably be happening to go into the not next year's budget, but the following year's budget. So, and the two other projects that we have, the electrical panel board replacements, uh, those might be able to be done this year. I'm still investigating to look into doing these projects, but they may have to, uh, this money may have to go back for those two projects as well. So um, just to give, letting the community know that these were slated to be done, but may not be done. But at this point in time, we're looking into doing those, but with these roofing projects will be done in the future. As far as um, maintenance projects, I know that there's been some concerns about some of the um, parking lot issues out of uh, the way the parking, parking lots do look in um, particularly at Columbia, the upper and low, uh, lower parking lots. There are some issues at the Governor Livingston High School. We have the Mountain Park parking lots. There's also, there is a uh, Mary Kay McMillan pathway that needs some work. And also there's the press box. Uh, from my understanding, there has been money that's been put into our maintenance reserves. And what we'd like to do at some point is have our architects look at these projects and have some schematics and drawings put together so that uh, we have some estimates and some numbers put together. So when we do go out to have pricing done for these, we have some good numbers. And when we do get pricing, we'll have... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the wording for this. A, gr a good idea by the architects that these projects will, done, will be done and done the correct way. I'll give you an instance. For the Mary Kay McMillan Pathway, our facility director went out and got some pricing, and they got three or four different pricings, but they varied so vastly is because one of them was just doing it a straight um, paving job. Another one included some drainage, and another one included drainage and some other different things to them, putting pavers in. Uh, I think we wanted to get them and, and do this the right way. I think if we included the drainage, I think this would preserve that pathway in going a long distance and may not have to do this again. So looking at it and doing the right what doing this the right way will preserve this project and having it going a long way and having to redo it. So I just wanted to in, um, inform the community that we do have the funds in a separate account, a maintenance reserve, and we're looking at getting this done. I'd like to thank you for listening to this um, uh, presentation this evening. And at this time, we'd like to uh, take on some questions. Does the board have any questions for the presentation? Mrs. Jolly. Um, so I'd like to um, just go back to the presentation and take a look at um, 
the statement regarding you know the number like maybe take it from the top and go and take uh, ask about the li line items that were less or you know or re relative to the other budgets i think based on the um initial preliminary detailed line budget that we received prior to um voting on the um preliminary budget um the comparison for the proposed 24-25 budget was done versus the revised 23-24 budget and versus the revised 23-24 budget, I could see that things were either flat or, you know, maybe even lower. However, when we look at our, what we're actually spending, so, you know, this, I go back to um, the attachments from the prior board meeting, it was the board secretary's report that shows our original budget plus transfers and gives us an adjusted budget. Um, when I look at those numbers and then I look at what is what we actually spent, right, versus encumbrances, if I look at those, some of those two up as our kind of actual spend, the numbers look a lot higher. So again, I, it's there are a lot of different versions of you know the numbers, and so again, versus the revised twenty three budget, they look you know flat or maybe lower across the line item. So I could see where that would be accurate. But when we compare to what we actually spend, our expenditures plus our encumbrances, verse look um, you know slightly different. So that was my one question, um, you know, regarding that, because I, I, I don't feel that it's necessarily that flat. Um, let, let me let me answer that question first. When when I'm doing a budget, I try to do apples to apples. When I'm doing budget figures from last year to budget figures for next year, um, that's where I keep apples to apples. So. When we talk in revised budget, um, that's where I was talking when I was in a finance meeting. I, I, I think that those figures are kind of skewed, and I try to not commingle transfers and re revisions. That's why I, I, to have an accurate number, I do budget to budget. So that's that's where I've, I've used my figures. And when we had our discussions in our finance meeting, I prefer to use the figures and the and the budget materials that I sent out first. That gives an ac a more accurate picture of, of what we're looking at and an apples to apples um, picture of what we're, we're looking at first. I mean, that, that's fair enough. But again, um, that's the apples to apples comparison. But then there's also the reality of what we're actually spending. And when we're act looking at what we're actually spending, and I also did a historical view um, looking at audited budgets, right, once, you know, they, they've been audited. And it looks, and I think I, I sent Mr. Nixon my analysis, it looks like when we're looking at proposed budgets versus audited budgets, you know, year over year, and I looked at 2018-19 budget um, as a starting point, you know, we would underspend in our audited budget versus proposed anywhere from eight hundred, like 900,000 to 2.2 million, which was the 22-23 year. So there's obviously some I guess, um, I don't know, cushion that's built into the budget and that's not necessarily a wrong thing to do because you know things may come up, but I'm trying to um, understand that um, where we are, our appropriations are now less than they were the year before. If we were to keep our tax, if, if, even if we weren't going to increase taxes, it looks like by increasing taxes, we're, some, we're missing like 900,000 in revenue or something. Like the numbers doesn't make, don't make sense given that our appropriations are less. And based on our current um, you know, projected spend, if that holds for the end of the year, and if we put back in, back into capital reserves the 1.7 million that Mr. Jeskowitz was talking about, you know, I still see a surplus of about 1.7 to 1.5 million. And so I'm I'm still trying to do the math to understand where is like our budget is lower, but we need an additional 900 in tax revenue. And to me, that would imply that we're losing a lot of revenue someplace else and the state aid was lower but it was low, only lower by like seven thousand so i consider that really flat um or that we are building in a certain percentage for you know a cushion and i like to understand if like what that might be 
because you're because our reserves right now are the same at the same level looking across maintenance and um, looking across capital reserves the reserves are at the same level as they were um, at the start of the year we're going to go put back another 1.7 million so our reserves total reserves are actually going to go up and then we have what again looks to be like another surplus um so i'm just i'm just not seeing how we need that at least like a two percent increase a 1.99 percent increase um when it seems that we are kind of way ahead this year in terms of what we're spending versus what we budgeted for i think what you're looking at you're, you're talking about budget versus spending those are two different things budget is put together beforehand and each year has to be treated separately you're, you're commingling years you can't do that maintenance reserve and capital reserve you can't utilize those funds they have to be spent for those specific reasons for anything that has to do with maintenance and anything that has to do with capital uh what happened the prior year in capital was that i if i'm not mistaken i don't have the numbers off the top of my head so don't quote me that was at 2.5 or 2.7 million dollars if i'm not mistaken at last year 1.7 was taken out of that which leaves somewhere about seven hundred thousand dollars now that money a portion of it was utilized for the retaining wall okay that and if it leaves 700 or 600,000 whatever the case may be that that 1.7 is going to go back in there to bring it back up to 2.5 and whenever we have to do those roofing projects again that money is going to have to be utilized for those projects and that electrical panel again so that money is going to go back and it's going to be brought back up to that level again so whatever your thinking about in terms, and I didn't get to answer your question because we were kind of consumed in trying to put and finalize this um, uh, presentation together and finalize it today. I actually started looking at the questions that you did send and we'll have an answer for you, but I didn't get to finalize um, those answers for you, uh, but it will be addressed. But that's kind of where you were going with, with the questions and the answer that I'm giving you. You can't commingle the funds. I know some of the questions that, that I think people are coming up with is that you want to take some of those funds of maintenance and cap reserve and put it toward this budget and reduce the tax levy or not utilize it at all. And I think that's what I'm hearing. No, no, that's not what I'm that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, I understand that the um, reserve amounts are meant for specific uses and I understand the putting back of the 1.7 million into capital reserve because it wasn't spent. What I'm saying is that after um, you know we do that, there will still be within the general fund, it appears um, based on what we budgeted versus what we spent, some additional funds, right? What additional funds are being left? Um, well, I, like, like I said, maybe um, I, until you have a chance to um, fully review the spreadsheet, it is um, in the spreadsheet. So you... Well, I, I think if you put the spreadsheet together, then what funds are left? You should know what well, funds I, are left, but I'm you're looking, saying that. I'm looking at the total line, uh, like at the total recap uh, mm -hmm. line, right? And so what I see as being left, um, once we move back the 1.72, is about 1.7. Because if you look at, again, if we go back to the board secretary's report from the last meeting, um, there, uh, what's available, quote unquote, is 3.3 million, of which 1.72, 1.7 has to go back to capital reserves. And I'm just looking at that difference. The 3.3, 3.4 minus the 1.72, I get 1.7 as being, quote unquote, available as per the board secretary's report. So Ms. Khanna, we had probably like a half hour discussion on surplus during the finance and facilities meeting. Uh, do you wanna maybe speak on this one? So we spent a lot of time trying to get to, you know, and I'll put it in simple words. I think the, and this was my my question, Natasha, you probably have this version of the same question, is if we look at our budget over the past few years and what we have, there's a budgeted number and then there's an actual number. And we see that we aren't really spending, which is, I guess, you know, credit to the administration is we are we're not spending as much as we are budgeting. I think the question that I have raised and I'm honestly struggling with is how much is, is enough in terms of surplus? Recognizing that 
it's a budget, you need a certain level of contingency for unplanned um, uh, expenditure that might happen along the way. But I think the question was, if we have consistently been generating, uh, you know, say a million or more in terms of surplus, how should we be looking at the tax levy? And I mean, the easy answer is let's take the 2% because, you know, that's that's sort of our default answer. But if we were trying to be uh, a little bit more, you know, fiscally responsible from a tax levy standpoint, is there a different answer? And we've, we've, we've talked about it and everybody has a different opinion on the, how we might be able to get there. Uh, so Natasha and I sort of had the same thought about, do we really need to go to the 1.99%, the 916K increase in tax levy, or is there a different lower answer? And could we, if we were to operate within the boundaries of how we have been doing so far? So I'm not sure that's an accurate description of what the conversation was in the finance and facilities meeting, because we talked about how uh, surplus is used in every budget to budget for the following year, because that way we can deal with 18% increase in insurance and uh, facilities, um, utilities and whatnot. All right. So it's, we know that we're building in even for next year, we're going to try to build in surplus because we use that surplus to help us with the 2% cap, right? That's kind of the discussion we had in there. We I did. know you have a point that you think that it could be lower, right? Which is fine, but the actual surplus itself, we build in on purpose. Now, some years we cannot have a lot of surplus because something happens, right? And we need to use those funds in some way, but the point of surplus is to be built in to help us with that 2% cap. So when we run into a huge increase, like we did with busing, when it was 60% increase a few years ago, we were able to manage that. Yes, to what you said, my point still holds. There was a conversation about, is there a different answer other than the you know 2%? And I think the point that Natasha was just hitting was uh, a different way to ask the same question is, is 1.99% what we as a district want to do? And at, when we think about the buildup of the surplus year over year, uh, is, there a certain, uh, is there a certain number that we are budgeting for, we are targeting for? Because this is a multi-year process. I understand that you start building the budget well in advance of how you are or when you're going to spend it. But I think it's just a question for us to think about as a district, as a board, is what is our long-term plan? Where are we going to be you know, in the next two years, three years, five years, um, keeping that view in mind? So I have a follow-up on this. It would have been really helpful if we could have seen, or if Mr. Jeskovic can give us, what's our current surplus as of now? How much do we have in our account? What's our current balance for capital reserve? What's our current balance for maintenance reserve? I know there is this 1.7 million that's in flux that they might put back in the capital reserve. So what So what are those numbers? How much surplus are we sitting on right now? It's what we have in the audit report. It's those same numbers. Uh, how much is that? Off the top of my head, I don't know. I have a, we have a million dollars that I just explained that we had in maintenance reserve. And I just said that we had somewhere about 2.5 or 2.7 that was in cap reserve. We took the 1.7 out that left about five or $700,000 uh, balance that was in there. Now the 1.7 has got to be brought back up. So it's going to bring that number back to 2.5 or 2.7. Okay. So, so yeah. Sorry, if I may, um, because uh, I looked at, again, from the attachments from our last board meeting, um, what we have in capital reserve, at least based on those attachments as of 331 is 2.24 million. Um, we also have in something called uh, the sale leaseback reserve account, I think another 2.24 million. And then we have in the maintenance reserve account, 1 million. So our total reserves across those three categories as outlined in those attachments is 5.486 million. So if we bring, uh, which is in line with, I think where 
Um, if we look at the AMR, um, that's in line with where the audited 2023. Is that the AMR or the CAFR? Um, I think they were, uh, I pulled from the AMR and. AMR is a management report. So okay. That's why I'm asking. Okay, I'll go back and I'll pull from the uh, more detailed report, but I thought the numbers tied out. So again, based at least on what it, we're seeing from the board secretary's report, we have total reserves that go across those three of 5.486 million. If we put back the 1.7, um, then that obviously brings that back up. Um, and just, just for a bit of context, um, looking at total reserve balances, um, in, uh, again, this is from the AMR. So, you know, if you take it with a grain of salt, I'll go back and look at the other report, but, um, for ending June 20, uh, at June, 2022, we increased, um, total reserves by 800,000 from prior year. And, uh, in 2023, we increased reserves by a total of 1.46 million. And that was our, I think, fiscal cliff year as well. So the reason I asked for the current surplus and the reserve amounts is I know we have surplus. Every project or every line item has to build in some contingency. Can we get what percentage of contingency is acceptable? Like as a district, as a board, we accept some, are we accepting 20% sub contingency in each line item? So if we need a million, are we automatically saying we need 20% more for some unforeseen, like, you know, just to be prepared. Is it 20%? Is it 14%? What, what are we referring to? So for the, in the budget line items, we what Natasha has pointed out is over a period of time from 2018 till 2022, 2023, we are over budgeting, but we are not. First off, I don't know that because I did not create any of those budgets. I only know about the 2425 that I put together and I don't have any contingencies put in that. I don't have 20% put in budget lines. So, but you have had like, so you've budgeted some amount for contingency. You have not budget. You I don't put contingencies in my budget. Um, I don't, I don't know where you're getting contingencies from and where that concept or idea is coming from. In my 2425, I don't have a contingency built in. Budgets or, or a budget? It's a number that is forecasted. So you're saying if we looked at your business um, and secretary's report from last month, let me pull that up. So I think it's from the month before. So we are seeing an actual spend and what was budgeted. And if we are coming under then what was actually budgeted for say transportation, are you going to take that money and what what are you going to do at the end of June at this school year? If last year we had budgeted for transportation. I can't say that right now because the end of the year is not here and I don't know that. If I knew what is going to be left over, I'd have a crystal ball, I'd play the lottery and I'd, I'd go out and I'd, I'd have money to, to, to win the lottery right now at this point. I, I really can't tell you that. There, there's, there's, there's contracts that are still out there for athletic transportation right now that have to be still looked at. There's still bills that are coming in. We're still taking transportations, uh, transportation that goes on till the spring at this point. There's, there's other matters that come in. Um, I'm going to say, um, I, I can't even think of some of the there's aid and loot transportation that still has to be paid out to parents because those are split into two different portions of the year. They get part of it paid, I believe, in February or March, and their final payment comes at the end of June. So that money's still in there to be paid. Can, can I ask a follow up to her question? The way I was reading the report, and maybe you're reading it in the same way, is there is an amount of money that we have already spent you know, year to date, right? Fiscal year to date. There is an encumbrance uh, number that's also on the page, which I equated to. Okay. This is the number that we have some sort of line of sight to that between now and June 30th, we are going to spend over, be it transportation or like a whole, a whole host of, you know, line items. And then there is another amount called available. And I think the interpretation of that report was that, when we look at what we have spent, 
okay. what's the encumbrance and what is left available. That number, once we take out the 1.7 million that was earmarked for the capital yes. projects, the estimate is about 1.5 to 1.7 million that we think is going to be in the available column. Is that, does that number I'm ring a bell? I'm see this. I don't have the report in front of me. If we wanted to speak to this tonight, I probably could have could have had that. I know we you have, have your questions. No, no, no. We have the report also, in front of us. I'm, I'm not even... prepared. I prepared for the budget question, and that was what I was prepared this evening to answer. Now, if we want to go into this today, could have easily done this at another time, but I'm I don't I'm not going to be looking at what report that you had. I could have done this more in depth. So, Mr. Jeskowitz, you need a little more time. I would say yes. That. Okay. Maybe That's the cool. Finance and Facilities Committee can look at and it I again. We had but... part of this discussion at one other point in time when we did have this. I know we we've brought this up at another meeting, and I did a, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I did quite a bit of an analysis when we went back and had this discussion. And if I don't, I do recall. I had a quite a bit of an answer that I did give. And also, right, when we look at these reports, right, what we owe is not necessarily full contracts that have not yet come in yet, right? So that usually what we know we owe is like, for instance, Union County Votech, we know we're going to owe them 80 thousand or whatever but we only no, that, pay that, them that's 40. Incumbent. That, that's incumbent like i had this right, conversation right, right. So with kelly saying, with, right. with other other so transportation 40, for the spring we would pay 40 in december we know there's still another 40 to be paid so that would be put in that encumbrance right but for transportation where we haven't actually spent that money yet because we haven't had the boys baseball team go off to their their event yet that's no longer yeah. in encumbrant, right? So when you look at that number, you can't say that's what we're going to spend by the end of the year, June 30th. That's not what that number means. That's an assumption that has been made, but that's not what that number actually means. So it's, Mr. Jeskowitz, we'll just give you a little more time to look no, at I, that. I would, I would suggest, mm -hmm. I, I'll answer your questions. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to them yet, just as I alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. And if we want to allude to the, the items again, let's send me what you have in terms of the report again, put it in there and I will answer them like I did on the, if I'm not mistaken, that was the February into the March when we had the first student co uh, contract, which wasn't included in the February board secretary's report, which was what? The 460 plus the 46,000, which then got into the March, brought that balance down, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, no, I, then I, that's probably there's something that I would have to look at that probably hasn't been encumbered. I'd have to talk to uh, Mrs. Sheehan about whatever might still be outstanding. That's probably in the transportation or whatever lines that you're also looking at. I'd have to look into it as well. Understood. I just want to confirm that Mr. Jeskowitz did respond to my um, query before and that it was um, so my analysis that uh, the latest version of what I have incorporates um, that feedback as well. Thank you. So, all right, did, um, Ms. Bradford, I have yes, a follow-up question. Yeah. So we do factor in, so from February to March, we see like there was in transportation, we were left with like 850,000. Now the latest report factors in all these contracts. And right now we are only left with $251,966. So my question is, what what is the total amount of surplus that we are left with currently? And if we are going to have, as mm -hmm. Natasha said, based on the latest report of reserves that we got from the board secretary, 5.486 million, and we might be moving back an additional 1.7 to this reserve, is it a want or a need for the district to increase the taxes by 1.99%, which is 916,000? Thank what, you. Uh, you're, you're, you're not this, getting this that, correctly. You're, you're, Again, I, we're, we're going back question? to that. We're going back to the capital and maintenance, and you're putting that all those numbers together. And until I get to take a look at it and and explain this, that's where you're getting this all together. Okay. And and there's also a, a question that Mrs. Jolly had had sent today, and there's a sale of a lease back to something that that is that is miscoded. That's in our board secretary report, and it's not put in CSI of what it's listed as, and that has to be changed, and it will be changed. And again, I haven't gotten to that, and that will be answered. Okay, so when you answer that, I have a basic overall holistic question. If 
Miss, whenever you do get to respond to Miss Jolly's questions, and if we have been budgeting more than what we project, we have been budgeting more than what we actually use, and we're coming under, which Mrs. Khanna act, said, it's kudos to the district administration. We're budgeting more, but we're actually coming under. So maybe we are doing a little bit of fiscal you know, maintenance. But if we are sitting on 1.7 million in reserves, is it fair for us in these times where the inflation has hit everybody to ask a, a 300,000 home for $135? And I looked at the survey. I wished we added a note in there that those 600 parents who responded to the budget survey were parents of students currently enrolled in Berkeley Heights Public Schools. But we do know that the entire community of Berkeley Heights, every taxpayer contributes to our taxes. So if we don't have to increase their taxes by $135, or if it's a 600, um, the average price of a house in Berkeley Heights is over half a million. So we are talking about $200 or $270 per household. And most of them don't have any skin in the game. They're not even sending students. There are seniors. And I'm, I can speak from my own experience. I was in between jobs. I work part-time. I go to buy to the farmer's market. I hardly buy half of the items that are on my list. So coming back to what we are currently sitting on in reserves, in our surplus, looking at that holistically, Mr. Nixon and Mr. Jiskovich, I would really honestly request you and the finance committee to look and see, is it a want or a need to increase by another 916,000? If we are sitting on 1.7 million, why do we need to increase by 916,000? Again, capital and maintenance. You're referring to that 1.7 no, constantly I'm, I'm all the time With that respect. I cannot no, touch. No, no, I cannot okay. touch that. Excuse and me. You're, you're, you're referring to it, and I've said it three we're, times respect. that you cannot touch we're that. We're going to let Mr. Jones capital go, and go capital back and reserve. take a look. Can't touch that. No, respectfully, I'm we're going to let Mr. Mr. Jaskowitz go yes, back and he take will a go look back. at no, that. No, Ms. Bradford, I agree, but I want to correct. You. I'm not yes, talking about- we have about, your question, and thank I'm, you for I'm that. I'm not talking about capital reserves or maintenance reserves. Thank you. I thank think, you. I, I think the one thing that will help, just clarity in terms of the process, right? Because we are all coming at it from a slightly different angle. You have a different angle based on your role. The way- our questions are the, the premise of the question is we see what is the actual spend looking at some of the reports. And we see that in all likelihood of the budgeted amount from last year, there might be at least a million dollars that was initially budgeted, but not spent. Now, on, in which account that it might go to, be it capital reserves, be it maintenance reserves. I think the premise of the question is, if we budgeted 60 or 61 million last year, we came in at say 58.5, just round numbers, just work with the logic here. We came in at say 58.5 and we had a, a plan of 60. Is there a way to use that difference in the plan versus the actuals as a means to fund the budget that we are talking about? I understand that from a process standpoint, that money sort of rolls into capital or rolls into maintenance reserve, right? The money that we don't spend at the end of the year, that money rolls into one of these accounts. Is that fair? One thing. One of the things that's been done is that there's money, budgeted fund balance has been utilized for several years now. It's got to, there's some funds that have to be put aside for that tax stabilization. It's got to come from somewhere. And at the end of the year, money, we have to, we have to curb spending at the end of the year to at least put those funds aside because it started, it started before I got here. And if that doesn't happen, and you, you continue to move on and don't put that money aside, where is it going to come from? So now, when you have future budgets and when you have to put that money in the budget and it's not there, where is it going to come from? Right. Where, where, and, and when the need comes from with that tax levy, your taxes are going to go through the roof. 
Okay, thank you very much. Something's got to get funded somewhere. And if it's not there, past years, it's been before I got here. It's been one, I'm going to say, I think it was one seven, and it's been progressively going up. Okay, we're going to let this discussion continue, and we're going to let you take a look at those. And if you have any more questions, please email them to um, Yes, I, I would Jeff suggest Phillips. that if we're going to have these discussions, I don't mind having them. Thank you. But I think we need to be prepared. And if you want to bring the answers out into the public, I don't mind doing that. I I prefer to be prepared and let we have everybody have another hear. meeting on May 7th. We're going to move on to business. Pamela has it. Uh, Mrs. Stanley. Sorry. So um, when we were looking at the budget, right? So when we looked at the budget survey, right, it came in that we really want to support our teachers, um, invest in them. Um, I know I've been talking to um, teachers in other districts, right? And we're losing teachers because they don't feel necessarily supported and it's a difficult job. And um, I just feel like we can put more money into paraprofessionals for kindergarten teachers, right? They are dealing with young kids that are very hard to manage, right? They're still learning how to be in a school classroom. Um, I feel like we learned about the blue gym, right? The blue gym here, it has a lot of needs and it will help with some of the equity that we see for girls volleyball. It will help with getting us maybe possibly a boys volleyball team. It will help us to actually put our best foot forward when we have teams come to visit, right? So everything from padding to volleyball lines to getting the banners up and done and, and showing off our amazing teams who work so hard. Um, I know that we're putting in a, a half of a school nurse here at GL. I've talked a couple of times about having a full-time floating district nurse, because not only can we help get that half a district nurse here, but then we can also have this nurse go on all the field trips and cover when a, a when a, uh, a nurse is out, right? And right now we are paying services that are very, very expensive to cover for our nurses who deserve to have a sick day, right? They deserve to be able to go to the doctor. They deserve to be able to do those things, but we don't have coverage for that. And we have to go out, right? Where we can have a floating nurse who covers GL mainly, but then they know, hey, so-and-so is going out on leave for a week. I need to go cover her post, right? And they can help as things rotate through. Um, I know the press box, right? It was in the presentation today. I think two years ago when I was on the athletic committee, it came up that the press box was in dire need. Um, I know the band, the marching band has been asking for new jackets for years because our budget is so tight. We haven't been able to do it. They just went to the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City showing off our wonderful district, right? We need to invest in these kids. Um, the swim team, they don't get the same kind of equipment budgets that our other teams do. Um, then we have right here in the lunchroom in GL, right? We have students who, who don't feel like they can find a table because this room is kind of on the smaller side, right? We have the Ed Foundation and then the PTOs trying to find funding to build um, lunch areas in other areas, right? To try to help with that. We can do this in a budget, but we need to invest in it, right? And so I do want to see us continue to invest in our district. We know that our buildings need a lot of help. We are looking to hopefully have a referendum in a few years. Um, so I do think that there is a lot more we can do. Thank you. We're going to move on to business now. I'm going to read resolution A for all board members. A, authorizing the Berkeley Heights Public Schools to enter into a settlement agreement with Laura Kapanitsky and Amy Milhalo whereas Laura Kapaniski and Amy Milhalo instituted litigation in the Superior Court of New Jersey, challenging the district's response to open public records act requests. And whereas the district desires to enter into a settlement agreement, settlement agreement with Ms. Kapazinski and Ms. Miloloff to avoid further litig litigation expenses. And whereas the board attorney has recommended the district execute the settlement agreement. And whereas the Board of Education believes that entering into this agreement is in the district's best interest. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education that the Berkeley Heights Public Schools County of Union, New Jersey, as follows. One, the district hereby ratifies and agrees to the settlement agreement. And two, the board president is hereby directed to execute the settlement agreement. And three, this resolution shall take effect immediately. Attachment four. Any discussion? 
I think um, we need a motion, don't we? First. Yes. I, I move the uh, the resolution to authorize the settlement agreement. Thank you. Second. Second. Any discussion? I just um, I would like the I would like to understand. I know we are authorizing a settlement amount today and a settlement agreement, but how much did the district spend in defending this case? I would like that publicly provided, maybe at the next board meeting, because this is a long long-standing case. And if we have come to this conclusion to prevent litigation expenses, I think the public deserves to know how much did we spend on this part these two particular cases. Thank you. We'll look into that. Mr. Sec, any other discussion? Mr. Secretary, roll call vote. Dr. Forger? Uh, yes. Ms. Jolly? Yes. Ms. Akiri? Yes. Ms. Connor? Yes. Ms. Stanley? Ms. Bradford? Yes. Motion passes. Comments from the public on any topic. During this portion of the meeting, district residents and staff are invited to address the Board of Education on any topic. The board requests that individuals state their name, address, town of residence, or school of attendance for the record. The specific action items that are commenting on and ask that all remarks be directed to the board president or designee, not to individual members or staff. The board asks that the members of the public be courteous and mindful of the rights of other individuals when speaking. Specifically, comments regarding personnel matters are discouraged and cannot be responded to by the board. Students and employees have specific legal rights afforded by the laws of New Jersey. The board bears no responsibility, nor will it be liable for any comments made by the pub members of the public. If a matter concerning a district staff member is of interest or concern to a resident, the matter should be referred to the responsible building principal, superintendent of schools, or the board of education, either by telephone, letter, or email. Although the board may not respond to items raised during the public forum, all public comments will be considered. Please note that if any member of the public becomes disruptive during the meeting, the board president may terminate the participant's statements. Continued disruptions may result in removal from the meeting or adjournment of the meeting. Each speaker's statement will be limited to three minutes in duration. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak? Serena Gabera, Columbia Middle School, Berkeley Heights. Hello, everyone. My family has a history here. Six of my siblings have gone through Columbia Middle School since the fall of 98 and were Tigers. People in this town have a history with this district. This week, an 80-year-old gentleman said that in 1952, he wore a Tiger jersey in second grade at Columbia Middle School, at, at Columbia School, not middle school. That was 72 years ago. Every year since people can remember, the annual yearbook had a tiger on the cover that a student drew. This year, the tiger is gone. The tradition of that contest is gone. The fun tiger mascot costume worn at the sports games and the annual volleyball game is gone. The Tiger Times was the newspaper that the writers of the school put together. It is now called the Highland Tiger Times. The tiger is painted on the gym floor. This school is ours. It belongs to us and it is paid for by our parents' taxes and all the people in this town. Will any of this year's tax money in the budget be used to strip off the tiger from the gym floor? Would it go to improving our bathrooms and sewage problems? Will, it tax, money, will tax money have to go for a new mascot costume? This decision by a new superintendent and new principal to rebrand the school without the public's consent should never have happened. All comments from the public are pro-Tiger, not the Highlander at Columbia Middle School. As we all found out in the past six weeks, not enough people were part of this supposed survey that went out about this mascot change. Can anyone here tell us who the people were who answered the survey? In about one and a half hours, I found 300 students who signed a paper titled, I want to be a Tiger again. Many of them were sixth graders who, were, in fifth grade, had been looking forward to being a tiger. Knowing now the reaction of the public, 
Will Mr. Kabliska, helped by Mr. Nixon, undo this decision? What was the outcome of their meeting last week? What did they decide? Please bring back our tiger. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? Mr. Uh, Nixon. Serena, I just want to speak to your comments a little bit. And, and first of all, thank you for your uh, your persistence with this topic. It's 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 impressive. Uh, it's admirable. And I think we all have a very good feeling for your passion on this, as well as uh, the passion that you know some other individuals feel towards it. Um, I have had some discussions uh, with Mr. Kobliska regarding this, um, and and I understand there is there is a long history and and a, a change that was recently made. And um, one of the top and one of the things I've I've had a conversation with our board president about is that um, in my role as acting superintendent, which goes for a few more weeks now beyond beyond this uh, beyond this date, um, my recommendation is I think more work needs to be done with this to try and you know devote some time to analyzing the process that occurred and analyze the information that we've been receiving uh, in recent weeks regarding this. And, and my recommendation would be once the board solidifies the superintendent position to charge that individual to work with Mr. Kabliska and, and put a plan together to really take a step back and, and kind of analyze what was done and put together a plan for how we might be able to move forward um, to resolve you know the, this concern. Um, may, may I add something, Mr. Newton? Sure. Um, we know that you're going to be moving on next year to GL. We would like to ask you and invite you to come back to be part of that committee to discuss this and look at maybe looking at all our, our mascots and our colors here in our district. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hoping that you might be able to do that for us. Yes, of course. Thank you. Mrs. Bradford, can I add something real quick in that same context? I think she brings up a great point and well, before great job, like this is, uh, I love how you've been doing this persistently, respectfully, and very much on point. So great job. Thank you so much. Uh, my, I think she brought up a great point in terms of funding and some of these changes that might be happening at the middle school in terms of, you know, change of colors or change of you know, what's in the gym floor. So is there a way that we could pause that, not dedicate funding quite yet till we get to a resolution on this so that we don't, you know, undo something that we should? Yes, I'm, I, I, I haven't seen any plan right now okay. to change any of those things. When I walked through Columbia Middle School the other day, I did notice in the gym, uh, the colors remain the same, the logos remain the same. Um, so... I don't think there's harm in, in pausing that while we can get more work done on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other um, comments from the public. So let's move on to new business. Uh, number one, annual professional appointments expired in December, 2023. Who brought this up for new business? It was me. I think yes. we have other priority items. We've been postponing that. So I think it got on the top, but I think let's move on mm -hmm. to. Okay, we'll go on to number two. 2025 budget survey planning with the goal of wider outreach to all taxpayers and include a unique identifier like block, lot, number, et cetera. Yes. So, um, yeah, so this, when I brought this uh, first to Dr. Varley and Dr. Giordano, um, they jumped right on board about the survey. Um, I had sent them Westfield survey. Um, so I'm just really glad that they took that advice and kind of said, yeah, we're going to go. So right away, they started talking to Jeremy about finding a way to do it with us. Westfield uses a really big um, program and it's very expensive. <laughs> very expensive program, but it's a great program to survey um, the residents and it's very interactive and it's really great. I know, I believe Dr. Giordano, you were working with the Ed Foundation, correct? To try to maybe bring that system to us. Yeah, I do have a, I spoke to the PTO president, that foundation president, vice president. I'm uh, trying to set up time to have the rep from the thought, uh, it's called thought exchange, have the rep meet with them and, and give them an overview of what the platform does 
and see if it's something that's viable for them to support and yeah. donate that to the district because they, they they as entities could use it as well. Yeah. So I just really want to thank Dr. Giordano and Mr. Marks for kind of taking this on uh, kind of late in the game um, and saying, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's find out how the residents feel um, so we could get a better idea as a board. Um, and so I'm really glad that we were able to accomplish that. So that's kind of where it was. I think Westfields already does what you're what you're saying and has other markers. It was just time wise. We were late to the game, but we still wanted to find a way to do it. So they use right what the tools that we currently have. And the easiest way to do it was to do it with known right uh, email contacts. Um, but obviously in the future, I definitely think we'll have a right now that we already did it once, right in the future, we can do it much sooner, get the process started much sooner. And if we have this new program in place, it will be much easier too. So in the, yeah, you can excuse go. me, uh, Dr. Forger. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great idea to do a community-wide survey. Um, couple of points though, I mean, you need some way to ensure that a member of the community is a member of the community and that everyone has a chance to respond only once. And I haven't figured out quite how they do that. It would be nice to know what Westfield did. Uh, the other thing is um, people have a tendency to ask for lots of things, especially when they don't have to pay for it. So uh, when you ask about payment, then they kind of shy away from that. A nice way to do it is to ask, if I give you a budget, how would you apply your budget so it's not unlimited you know then we get some idea of you know how would how would you spend i mean we had lots of uh things listed in the parent survey and of course paying for it wasn't one it wasn't a priority but realistically we do have the two percent budget cap so somehow the survey should mimic that there's a constrained problem here not an unconstrained problem I yield, I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Zakiri. Yeah. So the whole idea behind the survey was um, as a board member, I was not aware, like not a big deal. Great idea. When the survey came in, I was like, wow, okay, the district is sending us a survey. So, but as a public entity, I would hope that we have some surveying guidelines that we used who I would like to understand did any who provided input into these questions and how were these questions identified? And the reason I ask these or suggest that we have a survey planning for next year is I was at the other end or the receiving end of a, maybe a lot of people going through redistricting and reconfiguration called it a secured survey. The questions asked did not provide an ability to give a negative answer or a different answer. So in, in light of transparency, maybe should the board have announced if this was an idea that Mrs. Stanley had brought about and Dr. Wardley and Dr. Giordano were happy and we were working on it, there were no indication that parents were gonna be surveyed this year and we are working on a survey. So for next year, my hope is we work as a team. We let the community know now that the community is aware. Okay, 2024, 2025, we had a survey before the budget came in. So like how our neighboring districts do, we do a better job at publishing a budget calendar like New Providence saying that, hey, our budget calendar starts in September, October, or June. And then these are the things that we're going to do. We, we could even seek input on what are your priorities for next year, come up with like a planning process on what the questions are going to be. And there will be a lot of people in the community like seniors who might not even have an access to an email. So are we going to, how are we going to advertise it? Like, is there going to be an option for them to come to the district office and vote on it? Or is it going to be in the library? Is it going to be at the senior committee? Some ideas. So, I just hope we take this great first step that we have taken and add on to it. And surprise is good. It was a good surprise, but hopefully we are more planned for next year. So the finance and facilities committee did, did uh, get involved in it and they, they did put it in their minutes. Um, so, and then I believe 
um, Mr. Nixon had sent it to the Finance and Facilities Committee before it went out to parents. But yes, I agree. All of those things are true. We definitely need to find a way to make this a bigger thing. And I think getting the senior centers and everybody involved, just like we're going to try to do with the superintendent search, is great ideas. Thank you, Mrs. Akiri. Good suggestions. Uh, number four, publishing committee meeting minutes on district website, along with any attachments. I think we're going to be, I'm, I'm going to skip oh. number three for just a second. Yeah. Uh, I think I we're working like on to, that. Mrs. Bradford, I would like mm -hmm. to go in the order if we're going by order. So can mm -hmm. we go to number three? Thank you. We're going to go to number uh, four, publishing the committee meetings. That's a quick one. Okay. So are we going to do that? Um, I think we are going to do that. Right. Uh, and then so can, I, can I ask a clarifying question mm -hmm. on how we are going to do just so that we're all aware? Is the idea that we will have the committee minutes as kind of individual documents or in in a you know separate section on the on the web page or are they going to be included in the regular minutes can we just align on what's the method well they're already included in the regular minutes but included um verbatim what was published in the minutes or like a summary of it just so that what is given during our public meeting is then given to uh, Mrs. Oates, who then puts them into the minutes. Okay, so mm -hmm. if if all of us as you know committee chairs ask that here is you know we we publish minutes that are circulated mm -hmm. within the board, right? So as a practice, we should send that file over to Mrs. Oates and then say, can you please include that? on the website so she will then publish it is that the mechanism well, i don't think she has access to the website but she will if she does then she can put them into the minutes for the agenda okay. Madam President, okay. can i make Dr. a suggestion yeah, yeah yeah and i agree with you miss khan i can i just make a suggestion to the board i think once the chair approves those minutes because the way we work i know with the curriculum i'll send the minutes to dr forger once he approves them he'll send them to the committee yeah once the committee approves them then he sends them to the full board once those minutes are sent to the full board, they should be then they should be uploaded on on the website wherever Mr. Marks can wherever we want him to put it, he can put it up there. I, I'm a big believer. Once the full board gets the minutes and there and you guys see them, those minutes that are sent to you should be the minutes that are loaded up to the loaded up to the website. So I disagree with that because I know, for instance, there's confidential information in many of my minutes. Right, that's personnel is a totally different thing. But even thing. finance, right? There's multiple times. But minutes, you could take the confidential, you could take stuff out like that. You, right, you, so I don't you, think we can just send that to Samantha and have no. her just put it on there. We would need, somebody would need to go through and actually take yeah, out need, confidential information. we need to look at that. I, look, I, minutes, minutes are made, and, and I have the... Uh, the there's supposed to be a, a summation of what happened. They're not supposed to be, you know, certainly as detailed as maybe what you, you get, but the minutes that pub, people see that we held a meeting, this is what we discussed. You want to kind of keep it general. These were the questions asked. These are the answers given. You want to stay away from personal information, personal identifying information, um, anything like we wouldn't put security in those minutes for public review. Uh, we want to put personnel matters for public review. You can sit there and say, we, in personnel, we discuss the, um, we discuss the, uh, um, superintendent uh, search and, and kind of we're going to make a suggestion to the board at the next board meeting, you put things like that, but you can't sit there and say, we interviewed Mr. Nixon, Dr. John Owen, any other person for the superintendent shop. Those yeah. are things you got to keep out of that. And even NGSBA goes further and says that anything that hasn't been looked at by the full board yet, right, would right. be kind of confidential until the full board has a chance to look right. at it. So I, I, I do think that we can do that. I just think that it, there's an extra step. There's an extra step to confidentiality yeah, and just have to be careful about it. I agree. Right. I, I just want to make sure that we all, you know, agree on what is the process. We can agree to, you know, what that extra step is, what the timeline is, meaning we have a committee meeting, you know, maybe we'll publish the minutes, you know, a week into the meeting so that everybody has had a moment to review the minutes and then whatever is, is the, you know, timing that we approve or how we do it. I just want to be sure that Everybody's, you know, it's not a surprise. I, I agree. Particular, you know what I'm saying? Particularly like what you just said with personnel, because personnel is, you know. Right. My, well, my my point also is that I think in the 18th March minutes, I see finance was listed as hyperlinks because those were the files that I had sent over to Mrs. Oates. But some others were listed more 
more like an update, but not exactly the minutes as they were drafted. So I just wanted to make sure that we are all aligned on if they will be included as hyperlinks, so be it, but just that everybody's doing yeah, the same yeah, thing. Exactly. Well, so like I said, I, I actually am concerned about that because those were not reviewed for confidentiality, right? So, and that's where that extra step comes in. We need an extra step. So if Mr. Nixon, if you want to go and kind of make a procedure for this um, in the next couple of months, because I, I do think that that is important, right? We can't accidentally release something. Okay. So uh, Mrs. Bradford, this Mrs. was an Siri. item that I requested and I haven't had a chance to say one word. Yes, so if I may, theory. please. Thank you. So the reason for adding this particular new business item is we've heard for the last one year that we've been spending a lot on OPRA. The OPRA requests have gone up. Then what we release under OPRA has to be reviewed for confidentiality. Does it have to be redacted? And I just went back about three years ago our district had committee minutes. So if we are advertising to the public that we have created all these committees, we are doing all this great work, but unfortunately not in public because we're a board of committee, we can work as a board of committee. So technically, if you are a resident who cannot participate remotely for, on these meetings, but then they, they hear about these committees and what we're working on, the minutes are minutes. And except for personnel and finance. And even I have looked through each of them this year. I've looked at what was published on our district website previously. Maybe you'll, you're redacting one word or a two sentences. So the intent of this is to reduce OPRA requests, which will reduce the burden on the business and business administration office. All I'm, all my intent was to, I'm, to make a motion. I moved to pr publish committee meeting minutes on district website, along with any attachments reviewed within 10 days after the meeting has occurred. May I have a second? I don't think we can make a motion yet on new business because let's uh, give uh, the board time to think about I, it. I just moved a motion. I asked I'll, for a I'll second. second it, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the 10 days are very limiting, right? I know, right, for me as a committee chair, right, I have multiple committees. I know sometimes I have to work with the staff, right, to get the minutes out. Then I want to get it to committee members to look at it. Then I send it out to everybody else. Then someone else is going to have to look at it for confidentiality before we even get there. So I do think that that's limiting. Um, I also don't think that I was made aware that I was going to have to vote on this. Um, I think that's part of the 48 hour thing, but either way, I, I just think that this is again, beating something over the head. Um, and I don't think this is going to solve our Oprah request. I am all for putting minutes on. I just think that we need a procedure in place because we cannot have, right. We cannot have confidentiality being put out there because that's part of why we're constantly seeing issues, right. Is, is that's creating more legal issues. So you're trying to say that we need to save money by doing this, but we need to make sure we're going to make it worse, right? So again, I'm all for doing it, but let's put a procedure in place. Let's take our time to get a good procedure in place. Well, Mrs. Zakiri, when, would you be willing to wait until a procedure was in place for I'm, your motion? I'm willing to amend the motion to make it three weeks after a committee meeting happens. If you, are, if you want me to do that, I could do that because we do this all the time. Every other board is doing it. All we have to do is whoever is documenting the minutes, if there is something confidential, you can highlight it and tell the district staff that this particular sentence needs to be redacted if it is confidential. But the board, every board member and the district admin can see and review for ourselves. So I'm willing to amend my motion. If you want me to amend my motion, I can say I move to publish all committee meeting minutes on a district website along with any attachments reviewed in these committees within three weeks after the committee has met. Would you be willing to amend the motion to the next regular board meeting? No, I just amended it. I'm looking for a second. I'll, I'll second that, yeah. This should be a policy if we're going to be looking at this rather than a motion. 
Um, I'm, let's see if we, excuse me. Oh, yes. Would you like to speak to us? Do you want me to speak to this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So my, in my experience, I understand the motion here. Mm -hmm. um, my experience where boards can get, I'll, I'll tell you my preference. You can do this by way of motion. My concern is when boards do things like this by way of motion, in a few years, when someone says, why did we, you know, why are we doing this? People have to go back and look at the minutes and it gets lost. My recommendation, if this is something the board wants to do, is to have a policy put before the board. Therefore, it is clear, it's crisp, the board has approved the specific policy. And therefore, you never have to, when someone says, "How do? why do we do this? We could say it's directly in our policy. So you may, the motion, I'm not saying not to make the motion, but the motion may be to make a recommendation to amend a policy in place that therefore it's settled. But Thank you for the advice. It's again, it's your, yes. it's your decision. Yes. So I, be, I no, not the, the policy committee is here. I have somebody sitting next to me. If they want to create a policy, that great. Okay. But this motion is here because today is April 24th. We have multiple committees have met multiple times. There are no minutes out there. There were some of the issues that were discussed in some of these committees were of public concern for example, transportation, none of the public is aware what we discussed in a committee. And this is not exec session. I'm not talking confidential. The motion is on the floor. And if the committee, if the policy committee wants to come up with a more crisp, detailed language, I'm open to that. But my motion is to publish the committee meetings on the district website, along with any attachments reviewed within three weeks after a committee has met. So technically, if there were any committee meetings, we didn't have any in January. I think we only started meeting. We created the committees in February. So there are some of the minutes that have already been released, should have to be released immediately. Thank you. And I think the motion's on the floor so there can be discussion. Discussion. Mrs. Jolly? So um, given Mrs. Stanley's concern, I understand. Um, like, So if we were to have a committee meeting tomorrow, I think three weeks is enough time to go through the process of everyone publishing the minutes, reviewing them, and you know, agreeing there's no confidential um, information. But for, I think, for the committee meeting minutes that have like already happened, for the committees that already happened, I'm not 100% sure, like, because you still have to do that. And as you said, there were multiple. So that could be a little bit of a time consuming. So I wouldn't be comfortable saying like, oh, we should release those immediately. Okay, that's fine. Take your time to redact them. That could be a statement saying the motion passed. We need some time to redact and then publish them. I'm just saying going forward for any committees, once we meet, if we meet on May 1st, by May 21st or May 22nd, the minutes need to be uploaded onto the district website. And I think that's ample time. Lord, we're meeting on May 7th. So by May 30th, then three weeks. What, I didn't. I didn't understand no, I your. Mm -hmm. Sorry, May seventh, like the public meeting. You mean May seventh, right? So you're talking about the time when the committee meets. Yeah, yes, this is just the committee. Thank you. I'm, I'm only this discussion item is for committee meeting minutes, which don't need to be approved. I'm saying take three weeks. The board can circulate them in those three weeks. The person who writes the minutes can say, hey, this sentence is needs to be redacted, in my opinion, which we will we all have to agree with, or if they think that that has to be redacted, fine. But three weeks is ample time from, I'm just, I was just giving an example. If there is a committee meeting, I think, for example, um, technology, we are scheduled to meet on May 13th. There's a meeting on our calendar at 3 p.m. So I'm saying three weeks from May 13th, we should publish the minutes on the district website. So along the committee any... members have to look at those minutes and approve them. Which is what we do. Get that, which yeah. is what we do. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? I don't know. I heard a lot of like stipulation, like Thank we're going to have to cross out confidential, but she needs to agree with it. And I, that kind of stuff, I, I, I worry about that there's being more put into this than it's just putting the minutes like out. I, all I'm saying is confidentiality is bound by state law. We are only expected to redact. We can't over redact. We just voted on a settlement for, I don't know, the amount, if it was on the agenda for everybody, that was for over redaction. That's a lesson learned for us. So all I'm saying is, 
We are well, all. I believe that was confidential information. I think we. Need it to is. Know. It's all yeah. on. It's all on New Jersey courts, by the way. So nothing's confidential because it's a case. I'm saying. We only, a public entity can only redact for a valid reason, and there are confidentiality clauses. And we are all aware of it. We've all gone through multiple trainings. So it's not about me agreeing. It's about the entire board agreeing. Thank okay. you. I'm not sure that we all are agreed on what should be redacted or not. We need some type of a procedure. Mr. Nixon? If I could just ask a question uh, from the board as part of this motion. What... What's the expectation of the board as to, or maybe David, if you could even chime in on this, like who, who's responsible for that redacting prior to posting? Or, or, or were, were you suggesting that the person who creates the minutes does? Is, is somebody from the business office going to be expected? I think to previously, just, Mr. Because I just think we need to so iron out Mr. the procedure. Nixon, That's all. Previously, whenever the committee meeting minutes were released, they came from the business office. Okay. If you go back to 2022, 2023, they're all on there, on the district website. I think in 2023, people had to OPRA to get committee meeting minutes. So, and we have, um, so the business office looked at this finance committee or whatever, and then they redacted some words. But in 2022, and prior to that, all the committee minutes, unless they were removed from the district website, the old version had them. So if you want us to highlight, I'm saying, to make it easy, yes, we can highlight. If we're documenting something that's that needs to be confidential, that can be redacted. Who is uploading? So it's not, so if I, if you say that once everybody approves the minutes, it's up to the committee to upload them, sure. But I don't think we have those powers. Wasn't suggesting that. I, I, yeah. I heard a couple of different things through the conversation. Yes. And if we're not going to do this through policy, if we're going to do it through motion, I thought it was valid to make sure that we were just clear with what the expectations were. That's all. Yeah, Mr. Jeskowitz. From my understanding, on, and I've asked this in my office, there wasn't any committee meetings that were ever online, from my understanding. Now, again, I've only been here five months. They said that they never posted them up online. Uh, before 2022, they were on the district website. So I don't know what happened with the new website revamp, but there used to be committee. So like how people were able to search regular meeting minutes, exec meeting minutes, there were committee meeting up. Executive meeting minutes never posted online, only regular meeting minutes or special meeting minutes. That was the only things that were ever posted on the website. Okay. Maybe we do need a policy on this. This sounds like a lot of discussion going on. Fine, procedures. Go. I'm I'm open to creating a policy, but there's a motion on the floor now. Okay, Mr. Secretary. Ms. Curie. Yes. Dr. Foraker. Yes. Ms. Jolly. Yes. Ms. Connor. Yes. Ms. Stanley. No. Ms. Bradford. No. Motion passes. Okay, moving on to uh, number five, student and staff recognition events are planned as separate conference sessions of the board instead of being included as an agenda item on regular BOE meetings. Who suggested this? That was me. Can I postpone this for the next meeting? You may. Uh, discussion on legal fees and marketing uh, maximums. So this was um, this was mine, and I know that um, in the pr previous meeting we did not um, approve the uh, maximums for legal fees or marketing. So I would like to um, bring this back because I had checked with Mr. Cheskowitz and he said without um, those limits, um, it's kind of open-ended. So in the spirit of trying to um, you know, reduce our spending and our legal fees, I'd like to propose and put a motion forward similar like I had done at the previous meeting to establish the legal maximum uh, spending at 150,000 and the marketing fees at 10,000. So 150,000, not a small you know, amount. I think what was proposed at the um, prior meeting was 185,000 which was an increase from 170,000. So, and we know that, you know, if needed, you know, if absolutely needed, we could always come back to the table and increase like we've done in the past. But I think, I think like just autumn, just increasing the maximum from a prior year is not the direction, I guess, that we want to, to head in. That, so. that, that resolution is going to be on for the May 7th because it's part of the budget. So just letting you know as well. 
Okay, and can you tell me what amount was going to so, be? It's the same as that what I had for the uh, tentative. Okay, so, um, okay, well, uh, there's a motion on the table. I did not know that, but again, oh, I apologize. So um, putting forth a motion to set the maximum for legal fees at 150000 and for marketing at 10000 I second it. And discussion? And what was the, the, the second part of that again? That was the um, advertising, you said? Or? I, I called it marketing, but maybe it was advertising. I think it's public, public relations. relations. Yeah. Sorry. So I, and that I, was at 10? Yes, for 10,000. So I, if I can comment, I, I'm supportive. And I just look at it from, I think as, as a district, as a board, if we all agree that we want to maximize our tax dollars for the schools and the classrooms, we should be setting ourselves uh, a little bit of a, a, a target to limit the legal fees and an automatic increase is sort of doing exactly the opposite. And if there is a requirement that we need more authorization, I think that will happen along the way. I believe that's what happened the year before. So if we think about from setting ourselves a target, I I, I think it's better to set ourselves a, a stricter lower target than to you know just go for a higher number i also want to state that the public relations also includes employees uh that's correct i talk with our public relations and um uh, we do have some things coming up that maybe a referendum or things that are that may be looking forward to more publicity in terms of our superintendent search and our outreach to our stakeholders that may be limiting on this. So if I may speak, I think back to in 2021, when PR became a big topic was because we hired somebody from Sparta. I think we interviewed, Dr. Worley interviewed one, I think there was only one resume received. It was under Oprah. And we hired somebody at an hourly rate and not to exceed some, um, like I think it was, um, we can go back and look at the resolution. So there was a little bit of a public input at that time on saying, what are we actually doing in terms of public relation? Where are we posting? What exactly is being done? If it is content that's being sent to local newspapers, if it is content that's being put on our social media websites, and I think, oh, sorry, um, I believe based on the input, that position, that additional position was no longer, is no longer there. But also in 2022, without a board vote, the Berkeley Heights Board of Ed decided to shut down any engagement from community. But last year, we, pa we approved board goals where we said we are going to seek community in input and engagement. So right now, it seems a little bit hypocritical that the board goals are we're going to engage and seek community input and engagement, but we are, and we also want to spend a lot of amount, a lot of money on public relations, which technically right now is sending content to local newspapers, posting on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for district website. Anything that you post, a parent can't even comment and say, congratulations, great job, nothing. We have taken it away. There was no board vote. So if it is somebody, if what what is the district doing technically here? All we are doing is submitting content. So when you're submitting content, again, going back to Dipti's point, we need to look at ourselves and say, if this is just submitting content, how much, how many hours are we approving as a board? Are we just going to keep increasing? Yes, if there is a superintendent search coming, we have a superintendent search from their advertising. It's not the district. If what what is it different? What different what is it differently that we're doing? And if there is a need, yes, let the superintendent search firm come in front of the entire board and say, hey, we want you guys to spend an additional two thousand dollars in public relations to help us with the search. We can do that. I think we might have to create a superintendent search page. That's going to come up separately. What is it that the district does right now? We need to look at 
what are we spending on? Is it posting on these websites where a parent can't even comment? Then I think 10,000 is perfectly fine. Any other discussion? Mr. Secretary? Oh, was it second? Yes, it was. Ms. Charlie? Yes. Ms. Akiri? Yes. Dr. Foraga? Yes. Ms. Connor? Yes. Ms. Stanley? No. Ms. Bradford? No. Motion passes. Okay. Um, now we're going to go back to district busing plan. Or Mrs. Akiri, do you want to go back to number one? Or you're going to postpone that one? Yes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. A district busing plan going forward. Mr. Nixon, do we have an update? Mrs. Akiri, I think that this was your topic. Do you want to introduce it? Because um, I have some feedback based upon our uh, facilities and finance committee yeah. meeting as well. So if you uh, want to introduce it, go ahead. Yeah, the introduction is basically we've all, I think the community is very eager to know now that the transportation policy did not pass of for adding the hazardous routes, what is it that we are going to do as a district? And you can take over. Thank Great, you. thank you. Um, so, so we spoke to this topic at um, our finance and facilities committee meeting on Friday, and there was some um, we were trying to drill down to. You know, so where, where do we default to from that? Do we default to district past practice? Do we default to mandated only? Um, so uh, Mr. Jeskowitz, uh, Mrs. Sheehan, and I uh, agreed that we would speak to Mr. Disler on uh, on Monday morning and and kind of ask that question and, and, and get some legal advisement to that. So it actually works out very well that he's here with us this evening. Um, ultimately, he, he said that you know there, there wouldn't be anything in particular in the policy that would default us to a status quo, so to speak. However, um, whatever we would default to doesn't necessarily limit the board from making a decision about how we move forward uh, with transportation. Um, we talked about a lot of different things that should be specified if we ever wanted to revisit the policy and perhaps um, you know develop it moving forward in the future. Uh, so, so based upon that conversation that we had with Ms. Mr. Disler, um, Mrs. Sheehan went back and and developed uh, three different scenarios um, that that she might suggest uh, moving forward, uh, which which I want to share, and then ultimately, um, you know, ultimately get some feedback and have some discussion on and and move over there. So so um, initially there were two scenarios that we spoke about. Scenario one um, was was just absent of an approval of the hazardous routes policy and identifying students who sit on um, who are impacted by hazardous routes as receiving courtesy busing falling back to mandated busing uh, if we fall back to mandated busing only um, then students only students who qualify based upon mileage uh, would be eligible for busing um, then we would have to go out to bid for the bus routes because we'd be reducing our number of bus routes so as opposed to renewal we would be um, uh, we would we would have to go back out to bid and, and then you know kind of accept um, some of what we might hear back based upon that. Um, all in told, that would uh, um, there would be thirteen buses uh, with that in mind as opposed to sixteen buses um, with with limited uh, with limited seating available. Um, the the second scenario was the board could decide to. Um, maintain status quo, which is, um, you know, we make uh, busing eligible to everybody who's receiving busing based upon how it's being done this year, maintain uh, the 16 routes that we have um, while we continue to work on the policy and move forward, um, being that we have budgeted for those 16 routes moving into next school year already, give give the district some time to revisit that policy and take some of the feedback that we received from Mr. Disler and develop it further. Um, and then the the third scenario um, that we received that we spoke about was maintain the routes that we currently have the sixteen routes that we currently have um, offer mandated busing and eliminate courtesy busing but then make all of the seats available as part of the mandated routes um, available as uh, subscription seats available for students. 
uh, ultimately that uh, on the my maintaining those 16 buses we would have um over uh, approximately 250 seats projected available for subscriptions and and one of the positive impacts about this particular scenario is um it addresses mandated busing but it also still gives opportunities available for family to have a solution to um to transportation uh to and from schools again while if we choose to we can continue to work on uh, developing our transportation policy. Um, so we, really what we'd like to do is have have some discussion regarding this because uh, one of the things that Mrs. Sheehan shared is, is the timeline is getting very close. So, so typically letters would be going out to families um, uh, at the end of this week, beginning of the week before, um, looking for waiver requests, sharing registration deadlines, things like that. Um, around Wednesday, uh, the fifteenth would be with deadline to apply for transportation subscription bus busing, which is what we'd be looking back from families. Um, so, looking moving any further beyond this meeting um, really would limit her ability to have the movement she needs and be able to do the work that she needs uh, without any direction. Um, with some of the tight timelines that we have. So um, those are those are the three scenarios that that we discussed and, and talked about as options and um, I guess open it up for, for discussion. So Mr. Nixon, you're saying we need to come up with one of those three tonight. I, I think we, I think that's what we should focus on trying to do. So this way we can give Mrs. Sheehan some direction on how to move forward. And do you have a price on the subscription busing? Um, we we had a conversation. We would have to work on setting that as well. Uh, currently, subscription busing is $1,000 per route. Um, we had some conversations uh, based upon the aid and loon number where um, that number is 1165. Um, so we talked about, do we stay with the 1000? Do we move to the 1165 number there? We also spoke about, do we do we work on setting a limit for families? Um, if there's multiple children that... that um, would be engaging in subscription busing as well. Um, you know, similar to how we do with the activity fees that, you know, there, there is a cap for families. Mr. Gisler, did you have anything to add? No, but I'm happy to ask questions. Okay, uh, discussion, Dr. Forger. I just had a question. Is there any uh, rebid uh, required on options two and three? I know you mentioned rebid was needed on one, but what not on three, uh, but yes to two. Two two needs a rebid? Correct. Option three, sorry for not included. Uh, option three would, we would just renew our, our the current routes that we have. Renew, okay. No problem. Ma mandated only. Mandated only. Yeah. Op so quick summary, option one is mandated only. Needs a rebid. Option two, I'm sorry, we just got ourselves confused. Scenario one is mandated only, requires a rebid. Option two is status quo. We renew our current routes. Option three is mandated and open up the remaining seats as subscription, also a renew of our current routes. So that would be three would be a rebid then too? Three would not be a rebid, no. Okay, so, so the rebid's my... only on one. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. So by my count, it's only scenario one that will require a rebid. I Correct. think the, the big difference between scenarios two and three is the subscription uh, spots are far greater in scenario number three, uh, where we don't have automatic free courtesy busing available to anybody. We will have the mandated uh, as you know, defined by the mileage that the state has, and then any spots beyond that would be opened up for subscription to everybody. Currently, that is not what's happening. Correct. So technically, right, like if we went with status quo, you would still have all seats available for subscription. There just would be less seats because you would have hazardous. So that right, the, it's not hazardous. It's just courtesy busing. 
Right. So the same, the same thing, right? So two, right. You, it still has subscription. It's just, there's less seats because some of them are taken up by people who are on courtesy. Right. But when you look at number three, you're looking now at subscription seats of 250 seats, right? So now you're saying the people who can afford it, we're going to give busing to as a revenue where before, right. We were looking at only right? A handful of seats. And it was a way for us just to fill the bus and make revenue where now this is putting it more on the taxpayer of, well, if you can afford it, we can offer you busing. I think that changes the dynamic of that kind of busing. Um, I also know that I don't know if it's something we can sustain in the future, um, right? Maybe it'll get us through this year, but we still would need to look at busing for the following year. Um, the good thing is, is that it will keep, uh, CMS seats available because the most subscription busing we get for CMS is for CMS, um, where main ended only will not allow a lot of subscription busing to CMS. It will also keep a bus going to Mary Kay McMillan and Mountain Park, which we don't currently have if we go to mandated only. Um, and I, we know Mountain, uh, Mary Kay McMillan is a traffic problem, um, but I do think we're also talking, right? So we're losing 113 um, kids getting busing to GL, right? What did we think? Did we think that half of them are going to subscribe up to subscription busing? Like, what's the goal? Because we are worried about traffic here at GL. Um, and that's 113 kids that would now need to spend approximately a thousand dollars per child to get on a bus. Hopefully we have spots for them on their buses. Um, so I do think that's a concern. And then also I didn't hear anything about the Votec schools because we bus 96 children to Votec. Um, how is that busing? Is that going to be changed at all? Or we're just going to keep it in all three scenarios. I would, I'll have to get that exact answer. I, I believe it's not impacted by what we're discussing with these three scenarios here. Um, I understand the, the things you're saying. What, what we were trying to do here is absent of having um, a policy that defines hazardous routes and that also includes that students impacted by hazardous routes receive courtesy busing. We're trying to move forward to give direction for scheduling next year. And each of these three scenarios are, are very different um, in terms of what they offer. Um, but we need to come to some sort of understanding of you know which direction we want to move forward with so this way we can give direction to our transportation department uh, okay. for planning purposes so i'd like to make uh, a motion on that um you know to moving forward with that um and i, I want to make a motion to for the 2024 2025 school year and thereafter um uh, the Berkeley Heights Public Schools would provide only mandated and subscription busing, uh, along with you know, not including any of the special ed routes or the Votech busing. That that sort of uh, stands as is. But my motion is to for the 2024-25 school year and thereafter, we will offer mandated and subscription busing only. That's my motion. I'll second so it. Is that is that scenario three that maintains that's our sixteen yeah, rounds? Yeah, that's basically scenario three. Is is my understanding in the way we talked about it? So, so that, can I clarify one yeah. thing, Dipti? So, in your motion, you said you're moving for the 2024-2025 school year and thereafter, the Berkeley Heights Public Schools provide only mandated and subscription busing. Mandated and subscription busing. Along with any required busing for special ed. Right. So yes. this is... No, nothing yeah, changes for that. Nothing changes for the special ed routes. Nothing changes for, for the, the VOTEC routes. This is really about scenario okay. three as it relates to this conversation. And mandated is two miles to... Mandated is two, two miles to... Yes, two miles for the elementary. As per the state law. Yes. Correct. So I have some questions with that. So we're not going out to. Do you need a second on that? I just seconded it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Discuss so with Ms. Stanley. We would not go out to rebid. We would keep the 16 routes. I think the word thereafter is uh, an issue because if we only get, right? So if we have 250 seats and people don't buy them, we are now having buses for no reason on a contract. So I do think that thereafter needs to 
go in this motion because again, we would end up with that's five buses, right? Five extra buses that we wouldn't need if we don't fill those seats going in the future. So to clarify, I'm not saying that we put a certain number of routes on the motion. Like that's the motion not what I'm doesn't, saying. The motion doesn't My motion is not about a certain fixed number of routes. Depending on what is the requirement for the mandated busing and you know how many of our subscription spots that open up as it relates to that is what what the motion is so because but, every year because every year the transportation team will need to go and check how many students are qualified based on the mileage requirement that number is going to shift every year so this is about just as a matter of principle we are talking about mandated busing and we are talking about subscription spots that are available as a result. I just want, we, we do need to be clear on routes, though, because right. it's the difference between renewing or rebidding. Correct. So my understanding so is one that scenario with just mandated, um, we would be going out to rebid and have a, you know, a, a minimal amount of subscription seats available. The other scenario is we renew, don't rebid. And we offer all of the seats that we can identify as subscription yes, seats subscription. as available. Yeah. Correct, correct. And I think the distinction that I want to call out is um, there is the concept of what sort of busings we um, uh, provide as a school district. And there is the concept of mandated and the concept of subscription. But then when it comes to actually uh, including or approving the routes, I think per policy 8600, that is a separate activity by itself that the board will have to approve based on you know our understanding of the policy and our discussion in the finance committee is we will still need to approve the routes as a board or policy but this is just establishing the principle that we will offer this service right that is the mandated busing but also subscription busing as a service so just to be clear yeah. number one is mandated and we would still sell the empty seats for subscription. That's why I'm I'm questioning it because number one would require a rebid, but we would still have subscription on empty seats. So I think, again, I think the word thereafter needs to be removed because I think you're setting us up that we have to stay in 16 bus routes by no. saying, yes, That's if, not according what to what you is. just said, it is. If you said you're going with number three, we are not going for a rebid and that's 16 routes and 250 seats open, right? Again, we don't know how many of those seats will be taken up, but the following year, what if we have to go to scenario one, right? Because you said thereafter. And that's, that's fine. So again, think of it as we don't know what will happen the year after, because we don't know if we will need 16 routes. We, we'll need 12 routes. We have no idea. That will depend on how many students would qualify right. for so busing? Shouldn't we just vote for 24, 25? Because we don't know what will happen thereafter. No, but as the motion is going forward, because the district needs direction, we are saying we are going to end this inequitable practice of courtesy busing. We are saying going forward, we will only the district will only offer mandated and subscription. The routes number of students will depend on the number of students that are there for next year or going forward. And I'm hoping that the district, taking this as a lesson learned, Mr. Nixon, that we will go and re request for data. So we are not basically saying, will 250 seats be filled up? How many parents are interested? I think we normally, we send this survey out asking for the data, I think right before spring break or after. So maybe we could do it sooner so we have better idea. May it, Mr. Disler, I think yes. that there's kind of two different things we have here. Maybe we should have two separate resolutions. One, one stating to end the busing of what you're speaking about, and one to then separate going from one year to another so we're not having the 16 routes. Uh, and so I my, think that's that's what we need to do. So I I'm, think. I'm clarifying, right? I'm my motion is not to say we are locked into the 16 routes because the the number of routes and what that is is it's under a different policy. It's a different conversation. This is just establishing a principle of 
what are we as a district offering in terms of a bus service? So then why wouldn't we just put 24, 25? Mrs. Dolly. I think she has a point. Um, I just want to clarify, um, I guess, maybe the legal definition of subscription busing, because um, right now, the way it works, right, subscription busing is only offered to those buses that have open seats on mandated routes. Um, there are folks who, um, you know, and let's assume that everyone who's getting busing for free takes up those, uh, you know, still stays on the bus, pays for those seats, and, you know, but there are other folks who are interested in paying for busing, but they can't um, because there's not enough spots. So, you know, I, so I guess I want to understand, is subscription busing by definition only um, available seats on a mandated route? So that is not my understanding of subscription busing. I have not done substantial research on it. My understanding of subscription busing is that essentially a district, there are individuals, as you mentioned, right? The people legally are required to, right? If it's an IEP, the two, two and a half mile, those are required. There's something called courtesy busing that the district has the option to offer additional busing to individuals and the like. If you offer courtesy busing by law, you have to offer hazardous route busing. And but by you courtesy, you mean free? Free, okay. right? So courtesy busing is, you know, some districts I lived uh, previously in a very small district in Roseland. Roseland, everyone is under two and a half miles or two miles, but they offered busing to everyone for free, mm -hmm. right? So that is courtesy busing as an example, right? You don't have to do it, but as a district, as a board, you have the right to do it, right? We can offer busing to everyone. Uh, where we get to subscription busing is, now suppose we have X number of buses, available we have x slots legally we have no right you have no entitlement to free transportation um but we want to op open up the spots it does not in my understanding have to be on a mandatory bus right it's just we have spots here they are um feel free to pay us if you'd so, like and they don't not believe have to be district students or the like so under that um interpretation it is possible given once we get our survey results back you know, maybe not this year, um, not for the 24, 25 school year, but eventually when we, you know, start the process early, et cetera, we may, um, based on the responses and based on the software and the planning of the routes, could potentially come up with a route that is just subscription busing, right? Like that would just ha have subscription kids. That's possible, right? Yeah, I Okay. I believe that's okay. the case. So right. I just wanted to understand that. And then, um, okay, so that's, I, I have another point, but that's more to the pricing, which doesn't relate to this motion. So, and I think mm -hmm. the board secretary maybe suggested there's a way to split these into two motions because I can, I think if I understand the motion correctly, it's the idea here is courtesy busing hazards routes should really be subscription busing. Is that the, but we want to be able to, maintain the current busing for this upcoming school year is that the intent or did i not understand that correctly also no if i can so the intent is we've had this discussion um for a year at least now right if we go back and i think the last time we discussed this was the 30th march 2023 meeting so the if if the goal is for the district for everybody to have clarity as to what is the busing service that the district is going to provide? It's mandated and it's subscription. That That's really the intent. It doesn't go into a certain number of bus routes because obviously they change every year. And, you know, that is not what the motion is about. The motion is really about establishing a principle that as a district, we want to do subscription and we want to do mandated and that's it. Sure. And I think, if I may... I believe your policy said the board has to approve the routes, right? So I think that is the motion. It's just well, we we they, they can't approve the routes just yet because that no but wouldn't the happen. Is just that that so. But I think if I understand the board's directive, depending on what the vote is, you're going to give the information to your superintendent about the 16 routes that will be presented to the board at the upcoming another meeting. Did I get that correct? Right. It, so is that two scenarios are mandatory with opening subscription seats. The one that 
I think we're trying to suggest is the one that allows us to renew our current routes and have more subscription seats available for families. Sorry, if, if I may ask the question then, does this motion preclude us from or preclude the district transportation team from moving ahead with that scenario number three? No, but I think, I think the, sorry, I keep forgetting. I, I speak very loudly, so I just assume everyone can always hear me. So I think what your administration need is direction with regard to two things, right? Courtesy busing, none. And I think the direction, if this motion is, there will be no courtesy busing. Right. And as so that's direction number one, right? And that's by way of a motion here before you. Mo direction number two is at some point, if I understand correctly, the administration is going to ask this board to approve routes, correct? Now, that's not before you right now. No. But what will happen if they need direction, clearly, because you can't do that at a later time if they if you give different direction, because you just will run out of time. So I think you need the motion and direction. And I uh, think what here's here's what the motion is, and I think there's clarity that I, I, I was trying to establish. The motion was provide only mandated and subscription busing and special ed for 2024-25. And thereafter, yep. thereafter is the stipulation where we needed separation because thereafter in 25, 26 could change due to the fact of change with students where there could be a change from 16 down to 13 routes, which is to Mrs. Stanley's point, there could be a change and we may not want to be locked in with it. So no, my clarification to separate it into two separate motions is because of it locking in and should we use the word thereafter? No, Mr. So as I understand it, in this motion, what we are saying is the district will only offer mandated and subscription busing as well as special ed and any VOTEC. I think it only said any necessary special ed for starting 2024, 2025 and thereafter. That's it. There is nothing about routes. How many routes you come up with is up to the district, uh, is up to the administration. As of now, Mr. Nixon has the number. We are not talking about routes. So no, we next, are. so in this so motion, in this that. motion, we are not talking about routes. I want to clarify that. In this motion, we are no, only we are. talking about we're, we're, you're right. No routes. I'm, yes. I'm I'm just trying to establish what I just said. Yes. So was 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 thereafter. Thereafter, I also, think we need a motion just for 2425 and maybe just doing away with courtesy busing. No, I don't. Why? Why do we need? Why need? You're, why, not, you're not. Are you following what I'm saying? And and I think you. you, you my, so I, I have. I, so I believe what what we are talking about here is maybe two motions. One is the motion that I made that sort of establishes the principle of we will offer mandated busing and subscription busing. The second motion, going back to the point that Mr. Nixon raised about the, you know, the direction or the clarity for the transportation team is, is very prescriptive. It is scenario three, which does not uh, require a rebid. Now let me, uh, is that, Yes. Let me just let me just make yes. sure. You're, I think that right. you're, I think that's correct on that. Yes. yes, that's that's sort of the concern is the specific you know route. So I I that's, my my goal was not to kind of lock us into a certain number of routes. And, and, and next the, year it could and, be different. And the word thereafter was locking us in after twenty four twenty five, and that's what the concern was. So my, that's all. Yeah. So my my thought is this is two motions. One is just establishing, and that's why the thereafter is important because. If you're going to establish a principle of we will offer mandated and subscription busing, right? There is no confusion anymore as to what the district would do. That is one motion. The other one is specific for 2024, 2025, so that we avoid the rebid. That would mean we, we are moving a motion to uh, essentially approve scenario, asking to approve scenario number three. No, that will... so. And the timing of that, we can debate. We do that today. We do that, you know, in the next that, meeting. That means too. So what we are, our motion is only to clarify what the district is going to do starting from 2024, 2025 and thereafter. That's it. What the district <laughs> wants, how many routes it wants is up to the district 
to put them on the resolution as per the policy 8600, route by route. That's it. We're on the same page. But if a route changes, we have to rebid. As of now, there is no route change for this year. And next year, we will only offer, if this motion passes, yeah. there will be only mandated and subscription. And how many routes is something for the district to come to us and tell us next year if we are following 8600? So that's, that's, I don't know, that's not really where we are, but I just want to clarify, right? So this is 250 seats. That means that we're approximately five buses because there's 54 kids on a bus. If we have five buses, we know these routes are between 480 thousand dollars each depending on the route to the school how long it is etc that means we have 200k to 400k in busing and we're hoping to get about 250k in uh, revenue with a thousand dollars per seat so you can see where i'm a little bit concerned right this word thereafter is concerning to me because that's if every single person signs up for every single seat and we don't even have that that this year, right? There's already routes that we don't have total subscription seats filled because people don't want to sign up for it in certain buildings, right? So I, I'm a little bit concerned that where is this money coming from, right? Like this, this is, is- Sorry, mm -hmm. again, okay. Dr. This, Forger, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Connick. That's why I said, I, I think if you said, if you're doing away with courtesy and hazardous busing, Thereafter, I think that satisfies what you need to say and keeping your provide only mandated and subscription busing for 24-25, I think satisfies both of what you're trying to accomplish. That Sorry, might, can, uh, can you say that one more time? Uh, I'm going. I'm, I'm, what I was going to say is if take um, not, um, I got to say this again. Let me let me just think. If you're you're doing away with courtesy and hazardous hazardous busing. Moving forward, thereafter, going on, I'm, I'm trying to just get the wording, and keeping your resolution here, provide only mandated and subscription busing uh, and special ed for 2425, because then that leaves you to adjust what you need to do thereafter, depending on what the status is, because you'd have to go back and vote for 2526, depending on the situation, but you're you're moving forward not to have courtesy and uh, hazardous busing going forward. Wouldn't that take care of anything that you want going forward? Because now the, the board will vote not to have courtesy and hazardous busing going forward. So just as a matter of principle, we've never had a hazardous busing, right? So- But you had courtesy busing. We it had never unofficial policy. courtesy. We had unofficial courtesy busing provided by the district for how many ever years. I'm just trying to make sure that there is clarity not just for the school year that's starting in September, but sort of do away with the confusion, right? What are we doing? What are we offering? Okay, Dr. Borger. There, there is, uh, there's nothing in this motion that locks you into a particular number of routes. What we're, I think what we're looking for is to provide guidance to the administration. They're to provide mandatory. You always provide the mandatory and subscription busing. And this. This study, it doesn't even say that uh, the subscription only comes from the uh, buses that have mandatory on them, but there's nothing here that locks you into a particular number of routes. And indeed, you may have, there's nothing that locks you into anything here. What? So, <laughs> please, you don't have the floor. Okay. I think it's so simple. It's direction to the administration to provide mandatory and subscription busing. I don't like the term courtesy. That's the, but that's the, the courtesy is being misused here. Courtesy is actually subscription busing. Okay, subscription is a form of courtesy busing. Courtesy is anything that's not mandated. All right, we've been doing courtesy, but we really meant free. Okay, this policy is doing away courtesy, with free busing. Courtesy is That's free, all. subscription is paid. What? Courtesy is free, subscription is paid. No, courtesy is by the state definition, anything that is under those two or two and a half mile limits. That's courtesy because we don't have to provide it. We do it as a courtesy. 
Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Jolly. So I, I think, you know, for clarity's sake, I think we have Dipti's motion as the as the principal, and then we could have a separate motion for the guidance for scenario three for the current uh for the 24-25 school year. Um, agree with Tom in terms of how the state defines courtesy busing because based on the DTRS reports, uh, you know, they we for 23, we had 102 students that were um, subscription and 349 that were under the courtesy. So 349 minus 102 gives us the approximate 250 students that were getting, um, I think, free busing essentially. So I don't know from a pricing perspective, again, I, I would love to see the analysis and the numbers because, um, and I'm sorry, Pam, I wasn't following the, because I, if I, if people are getting something free and now they're going to pay for it, I expect that it's, you know, a revenue increase, at least for this year, given that we're not changing or rebidding the routes. So I would love to see some of the numbers because I also I'm not convinced that you know we need to charge at the higher threshold, considering that we're going to have more people paying in, and we can you know maybe soften the blow and keep our budget where it is if we're going to charge more people for busing. Thank you. Any other con any other discussion? Mrs. Kana, will you restate your motion? It's been a while. So my motion is I move um, to that for the 2024-2025 school year and thereafter, the Berkeley Heights Public Schools will provide only mandated and subscription busing along with any required busing for special education students and VOTEC students. The mandated busing here is essentially the mileage requirements as defined by the state. That is motion number one. And then we can have a second motion as required. I seconded this motion. I think we need to points. vote on this one right now. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Juskowitz, do you have that motion down? Yep, and if I need clarity, I'll ask you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> I can email it to you, Mr. Juskowitz. Okay, Mr. Secretary, a vote. Mrs. Connor. Yes. Mr. Kiri. Yes. Dr. Foraker. Yes. Ms. Charlie. Yes. Ms. Stanley. No. Ms. Bradford. No. Motion passes. Now, do we, we have make, a second motion? Yeah, can we make the second motion? No, but let me ask you this. Why the second motion of 16 routes needs to come from the district if as part of policy 8600? That's a district recommendation. This is the this is a motion. Now it's up to the district administration to come to us and say, this is the motion. Do we need 16 routes? Do we need what? That's a district resolution. It can come today or Mr. Nixon can suggest that recommend it as the district administrator based on what we just voted on. If I could just clarify, we understand that, but part of what we were speaking about in the beginning is we need to give direction to Mrs. Sheehan to move. So she either has to rebid or renew. And if we don't give her direction based upon our conversation tonight and she renews, and then that's not approved, okay. then I have a concern about our direction. I mean, I think that was part of the discussion because essentially the motion that we just voted for applies to scenario one and scenario three. We need to provide direction about are we going out to rebid now or are we going to renew our routes? So we're moving forward with reducing it to 13 routes and rebidding or we're moving forward with 16 routes and renewing. We we need we need to give direction on no, that. No, but in scenario one is only mandated. How does... No, no, no. So what scenario is, three. No, scenario one that you just gave us with 13 routes was mandated only. So the resolution that just passed doesn't apply to scenario one. No, I think so. I think that the idea is that um, if it's only mandated, you're going to have X number, a smaller number or different yeah. routes, and then you would still open up those seats to subscription busing like it would be foolish not to. Yeah, hold on. Um, Mr. Nixon, I noted down when you wrote it to me. So if you can repeat what is option one, 
you said falling back to mandated busing because 8600 failed 13 buses instead of 16 only mandated option one is only mandated according to what you just gave us is that correct Not exactly. Scenario one and scenario two were the were were the initial discussion based upon policy eighty six hundred not being approved. So do we default to mandatory only, which would put us out to rebid to reduce the thirteen routes, and then yes, that would include a limited number of seats uh, for uh, open for subscription. Scenario two would be to resort to status quo, what we've always been doing with with the courtesy busing as we have done it. Scenario three, the difference between that and scenario one was that scenario three is also only mandated, but we maintain our 16 routes. It gives us the opportunity to offer more seats for more families, and, and it allows us to renew instead of going out to rebid. Okay. Is the scenario three, 16 routes... Um, are some of those pure subscription, no mandated students on there? Um, Mr. Dr. Nixon, Borger, could you uh, just wait a second? Okay. <laughs> okay. And Dr. Porger, could you repeat the question? Because I don't think everyone heard. Okay. Uh, with scenario three, at 16 routes mandated. All seats were available for subscription. Um. But does that does that include the possibility that some of the people on a bus are all subscription? Yes, because Mary Kay McMillan and Mountain Park would have no one in courtesy and there is no mandated to those schools. Yeah, it is possible. And that was Natasha's clarification with David that once we move past the motion, Dipti's motion about offering only subscription and mandated, if there is interest, on option three, we can run subscription only routes. Can you confirm that, Mr. Nixon? Not without speaking with Mr. Sheehan. The, going to 13 routes instead of 16 routes mm -hmm. means she's, she'll have to do work to reconfigure the no, routes. No, going to the 16 routes. I'm so I'm talking option three. Mm -hmm. Mr. For Dr. Forrest's question was option three. You can run subscription only routes, bus routes, correct? I mean, I'm not sure. I end up in so we theory. Could to. we decide that one bus is empty and is subscription only? Yeah, I suppose, but I think that limits the flexibility that. Mrs. Sheehan has in terms of if you need creating if, efficient routes. I no. think creating efficient routes is part Maybe of it. Maybe just a question that solves this. Is the real guidance you need right now, is it the motion just to renew the current routes? Yes. Or to then, the instruction is to rebid them? Right? Yes. I think, does that solve the problem we yes. give you? Yes. And then once the routes are created, and then we'll you have, pre present how then we... once the routes are created, then they'll be presented to the board for approval. So how are we expected to renew the current routes when we don't even know what the routes are? We just have to because go by a number? we have to go to rebid. Correct. That has to be developed. There's a difference between determining the number of routes that we need versus developing the routes and, and defining what the routes are. So let me ask you this. on what... I, and I, I think maybe we're using the words routes differently. When we're, I'm saying 16 routes. Mm -hmm as a route, the specific routes, once they're put together, in other words, you know, um, which, which buses configure to what locations and things like that are something that will have to be approved no. as per policy 8,600, correct, no. David? So unfortunately, if you look at our contracts with the busing company, they, they specify which bus goes to which building and we cannot change those routes. So let's say we have a GL route and then later it goes to Woodruff, that has to stay the same. We would have to rebid to change that, which the finance committee went over a bunch. So that means that we will have at least one that we know of, Mary Kay McMillan and Mountain Park, that currently, right, is currently going. That would be only subscription because of the fact that they were previously under courtesy, right? So there was like, I don't know, 14 kids or in one school that were a courtesy because they lived in on Emerson. 
because we're no longer going with courtesy or hazardous, right? Those kids no longer get those free busing. So it'd be that route would have to remain because it's, we're not going for a rebid. So and it would be why, subscription only. If we are not, re, if, to re, why do we need to vote on the, my basic question is, we passed a motion on, for this year and going thereafter, we are only going to give mandated and subscription. So it's up to the district. What is time sensitive that you need a vote and a motion on April 24th? These routes are, so option three doesn't need to be rebid, right? So we don't know based on the interest, on how many students are coming up and how we are going to go about it. So option three doesn't change anything. Why do we need a motion? What is time sensitive about it? Because we have to go out for a rebid if we're going to change the route. No, we are not changing that the now. So well, right, but you need a motion to actually say that you want to not change the routes because otherwise, right, we would be we would be saving money by getting rid of three buses. But then the problem is, is rebid, we know that they can come up with a spike in pricing. So I'm I'm getting the sense this conversation is actually what policy 8600 asks us to do, which is approve the routes. And I think right now, if we go down this path, we have we haven't seen what the routes are. We are just sort of giving a blanket approval. I think that's where you're coming from. So I get it. I'm just curious, Mr. Nixon, do we need to have this vote right now or with the motion that we just passed gives the district the ability to move forward. I think we've discussed now that we don't expect a rebid process to happen because under the last motion, it gives the district the flexibility. So I'm worried about putting a very prescriptive motion right this minute without seeing the routes. Uh, I don't want to restrict the ability to for for you know Kelly to plan. So I'm just asking, based so, on what we already have said yes to, that would give the flexibility to go and, and you know, create the routes, which could then come back to the board, perhaps on the 7th May meeting for approval. I, because I, the cost is in, the, the, the concern is, you know, do we have the money in the budget? And the way I understand it, that money is in the budget. I, I, I and as right. we've had in these prior meetings. Yeah. I, and it, if I can, I mean, let's let's just default to to Mr. Disler just on that. So, so long as we we're all in agreement, the direction I will give Mrs. Sheehan moving forward from this meeting is go ahead and renew those routes and begin your planning. Okay. So I do think we need a vote on it because other right, like I think we've had some discussion tonight that makes me question it because right, like we we can't change the route, right? We can change who we're picking up, but we can't change the route. So we're just saying, yes, we're going to keep the current routes. So can we just vote to say we're going to keep the current routes, right? So we don't have to go to Revit. Let's just vote on that so Kelly is clear that we don't have to go to Revit. Just one question. I, um, so, and the routes that are is particularly problematic if there is a lack of interest in the subscription piece, which would be, the Mary Kay. Um, so that's that's the only one I know of that would be subscription. Well, I think based off on the top of my head, but right. you would have to ask but Kelly. Based on the analysis, uh, I think that Kelly did for the finance committee. If there was no hazardous routes, um, well, if we had hazardous routes, you would have two buses. Um, I think in to uh, of for Mary Kay and Mountain Park was it Mountain Park that would have a total of twenty seven kids that would be on hazardous and like eighty one seats open for subscription. So, so I almost think that, you know, we're kind of in almost that same scenario because we would have had majority of subscription seats open. So now we're saying they're all going to be subscription. My one question is those routes, because we do have Berkeley Heights Board of Education buses, right? And I'm guessing that those are not uh, the buses that are running the Mary Kay route. Is that, no? We, so Nata, I have a, I don't believe we have to vote on this motion to approve those 16 routes because technically the routes can change because this is for next school year. And Toll Brothers, one of the example that I'm going to give you is Toll Brothers recently opened 
per occupancy. So there could be students coming in there, right? And there are multiple developments happening all over Berkeley Heights. So there is no need on April 24th to give direction to the transportation director or supervisor that these are the routes. The routes will change if students come. So tomorrow Toll Brothers has, adds, let's say, five students and they all go to GL. That's mandated because Toll Brothers is 2.5 miles away from GL. So are you going to, as a district, are we going to deny and say we are not going to change the route? We're not going to abide by the state law? No. So there is a lot of flexibility in, so we, are, we have given the direction that the district needs. There is no need for us to specify in April 2024 on what the routes are going to be because the routes are going to change based on the enrollment. So that's not entirely true because the routes, like we said, are already right bid and we have a contract that says we have these routes. We need to renew the contract or go out to rebid. What is right? the date to renew? I, or I want to say it was May something, but I don't know because you, I'm not the transportation department, but these are in the contract. We can't change the route right? Where the bus goes, what time it goes, when it goes without rebidding, which is what the finance department had spoke with multiple times. If we do get another hundred kids, right? And we need two more buses to do mandated, we could try to fit them on the current buses. If they don't fit, we would have to go out to a company and get that, which is what we're currently doing this year, right? We're spending a lot of money to get one bus, right? I forget what Kelly said. It was like 80. 5,000 or something so that we're I'd, spending for so a bus. Just to answer, I'd, so I'm the not, routes do matter. So I'm not privy to all this detailed information that happens in finance and facilities. I've just looked at the minutes. All I'm saying is there is some ambiguity. The dates are not available. There is some information that can only be clarified by Mrs. Sheehan. So I would say if there is a need, and I don't see the need because there is no date. When do these contra re these routes need to be rebid or renewed? It's some date in May. It could be after May 7th. I did hear Mr. Jaskowitz say at a previous meeting, if we can get direction until May 7th, we can make this happen. So let's wait until May 7th. If the date is before, then Mr. Nixon will advise us on the need for a special meeting or whatever need to be. Because right now we are all flying blind here. We don't know what is the urgency. What's the date for this contract to be renewed or rebid? Mr. Nixon, well, do we need to determine the price so parents know how much subscription busing will cost when Kelly puts out her letter next week? Yes. I'm gonna, that that was part of our conversation as well. Do mm -hmm. do we maintain the current cost and do we change the current cost and or, or do we create a cap for families? Those those were the topics that we were discussing. Mrs. Jolly. So, um, okay, two things. So with the routes, if you said, for example, option two, where we do the exact same thing, right? How do you know, like, how do you know that you would, after going out to the community and asking for the demand, right? It almost seems like we're putting the routes before we actually know what the demand is. And, and so that's why, that's why I think, you know, some folks here are sitting a little uncomfortably, right? We're, uh, we're saying, yes, go ahead, renew, but we don't really know because, you know, because we haven't gotten the, you know, feedback yet. If the feedback comes in that no one's interested in, you know, the Mary Kay route, then we're going to have, we've re renewed a contract for an empty bus, right? And that, that's what doesn't make sense. So I'm saying like, if we, you know, if we did nothing, we, if we did everything the same, even, you know, we'd likely probably have the same routes, but we still need the information from the community. I also don't know how we can go ahead and set pricing without knowing the demand, right? Um, because you've put up forth the price, your demand may, like people may not want to pay $1,000, right? But if you maybe have it at a lower rate, you might have more people buying in. So I almost think you have to understand what is the demand and how, like what people are willing to come in for subscription busing and then see how many people you have, um, you know, interested and then kind of price it out after that. So I'm, I, 
again, not in the transportation office, but it just seems that we're approving routes before we know the demand. We're pricing things before we know how many people are interested. And by setting that price, you might actually drive some people away because it's not affordable. Also, uh, every year I get the survey. Are you interested in you know, using transportation for your student? And then when parents say yes, I think only a, a particular amount is requested by the district, which is half of whatever we've come up with. But because this is a, this is all new, we are starting afresh. We we never had this option before, so we need to take. I would basically ask the finance and facilities committee to go and look at what kind of aid we've got. Because I I remember last March I asked Julie. I think we got some aid for safety and security from the state, which was about, I don't know, it could be 300,000 or 400,000. And I said, does this have to be specifically used for security only? And she said, no, the state law allows for me to use this for any other line items, which is student related. So we could be sitting on some of this aid that we got from the state that can be diverted towards busing so that we can soften the blow of sorts for parents who are suddenly being asked to pay. So I don't think without going back to the drawing board from the finance and facilities committee to look at what are the available options. Do we have the same amount for safety and security from the state? And if if the pre previous BA felt that that could be used towards anything else, maybe this is the year to use it toward transportation. So we basically say we're reducing it and this is the new offer. Mr. Juskowitz. If there is money, I don't know what money that might have been talked about last year. I don't see it or I don't have any possession of it. So again, right, we're going to, Kelly will start with mandated, right? So she sends it out to the mandated parents. They come back and say, yes, I'm going to take it next year. So she knows approximately who got it this year who denied it this year, who's going to what school next year, right? So we kind of know that already there, right? And then once she gets that, then she gets how many seats are left on that route, on that bus, right? And that's where the parents come in and she says, would you like to volunteer for this? But she can only give the amount of seats on that bus to that school because of the fact that we are tied into these routes, but it's just like the budget, right? We are making estimates for September, but they have to be done now, Right. She has to go out to parents now. Right. With this information so she can because all summer long, she is literally doing the routes on this new system that we have to actually decide how to run the bus most efficiently. But there's so the one thing that I, I can't fully comprehend is what is stopping her from doing that. Like I we, we all agree that we want to move forward with mandated and subscription busing. I I. What I'm trying here to not get into necessarily without all the data is locking us into a certain number of routes we we don't know. And that's the sort of the, the demand conversation I think is really important to understand what is the demand so that we can then, you know, and that's why I feel like she needs the time to do the work given the parameters are broad enough to, yes, we want to do mandated, yes, we want to do subscription, to then actually give us the routes that we will eventually, you know, approve. Yeah. As long as, and the other, I think the other component that is uh, a little bit of a trigger is, does this impact the budget? And I think from what I have seen in the budget, from what we have repeatedly heard, the budget does not have any amount of rebid in, you know, it, it does not anticipate a rebid. What the budget cost right now has is we take the, the cost that we pay for the routes today, we increase it by a certain percentage, and we have a certain cost number in our budget. And I don't think we are debating that right now. I, right, we, I, we I got, think this is just looking for, and I think the, the blessing, it's going to be a rebid because I, for, for time, time it's, it's a, a time consumption for rebidding. That's going to take us out of here. No, hold on. How is it a rebid? No, no, no. Not a re no, I, I, not I, a rebid. Can I speak, please? I, I, I think, I think what we're trying to get to is by moving toward moving away from any courtesy busing at all presents a major change to our school community and what they've been used to. 
I think what we're suggesting, and 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 we're not going to have some of that information because we could ask people, you know, would you be interested in paying for subscription busing? And they could say yes, but you don't know until you get the deposit or the payment. I think what we're trying to do is have our community in mind. Since we have the 16 routes that we're proposing that we renew budgeted for next school year already, um, try and create a scenario that um, – gives gives another gives more options to more people as opposed to limiting the number of routes that we have. I think that's what we're trying to do. We're proposing a major change and what we want to do is is have options available for the families and for students. So I, I think we have the direction that we need. We are we're gonna we're gonna move through with scenario three that I described before. The last thing we have to sit with is identifying what the cost is that's going to put out. We've we've what we've been charging for subscription seating is a thousand dollars per student. So not hearing anything different than that, that we can get through specifically tonight, the direction that I should give Mrs. Sheehan is to move forward with what we've done in the past, as far as subscription seating has occurred. So do we have a general understanding? Yes. 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 Okay. So you're proposing you. stay to a thousand. Absent of another specific direction. Yes. Unless we, the finance committee, and we look at what we got from the state, which was the line item from last year, and we can ask you to take a look we, at it. We'll have to see if there is there is money. And I think my thought is we we look at, you know, establishing some sort of a maximum. And again, it will require some information on what's the demand out there so we can figure out, you know, what's the what's the optimum amount of money that we want to charge for this service. Historically, we have been, you know, putting a price tag of $1,000. As you have multiple students in a family that need the service, it does start getting steep. So I, I think the, the the one kind of idea would be, let's see what the demand is. I don't know if there's a way to soften the blow beyond, you know, the $1,000. If we can, that'll be great. But just it, let's think about families that have multiple students that I'll will subscribe uh, you know, to see if there's a way to be more efficient. Also, we have a precedent when we did something different, when we did something which was never done in the district, like redistricting and reconfiguration, I think the board voted to keep the busing, the subscription busing cost at $500 for anybody who was impacted by redistricting and reconfiguration in 2021. Yes, there is a resolution. I was one of those impacted parents. I got an email. If I wanted to bus my child to Hughes instead of Woodruff, I would, the very, the very first rollout, for the very first year of rollout, it was capped at 500. So if we've done that in the past, maybe we can do that now. We can cap it for anybody who was currently on courtesy busing routes and not paying. Maybe we can cap it at 500. We've done it in the past. There was a resolution. There is the minutes. The board has done it. We can make it happen. And we also, we haven't yet had the discussion on what is our actual surplus? How much are we going to have? We're going to get those answers. And if the previous board has done it to make it easier on parents because this is a major change, I think we should all work towards making that happen for the community. A $500 cap would not be sustainable in terms of our bus routes. Well, we've, all I'm saying is, Mrs. Bradford, if we had the will, because we are making a change, the previous board made a change about redistrict and redistricting and reconfiguration. We don't want to, we can take a cue from there. There, was, there has been precedent where parents who were impacted by redistricting and reconfiguration were charged only $500. Mrs. And if they had two children, it was, you can go back and look at the resolution. Mrs. Khanna just so that we don't get ahead of ourselves because yeah. I really think we need to look at the numbers. Kelly needs time to get the data. Let's not put a number out there. Let's not put a cap out there. Let's get the demand. Let's look at it holistically and then, you know, figure out what is the number that, that we want to send to the community. Just so, but you know, I guess it depends on how you're getting the demand, right? If you're saying like, are you willing to, you know, sign on for subscription busing for a thousand dollars? Right. If you're right. if you're putting put, put the number max, out there. Right. Put 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 yeah, maybe. put a max. If we look at historically what we've done, it's a thousand. If if we if we agree that we will not go beyond a thousand, maybe that's a maximum number and then 
you know, again, this is the first time we would do this. I imagine there's going to be some transition. Maybe our answer next year might be different depending on what the routes are, depending on what the demand is. I think this is like for 2024, 2025, maybe we, we plan in a certain way, but give ourselves a little bit of room for next year. I mean, the year after. I just want to remind the board that we are going to be having students cross dangerous roads or roads that were determined hazardous in Berkeley Heights, and those students will be walking. With, based on black box data, with no weightage given to the streets, Mrs. Bradford, with all due respect. But now you're saying that those people deserve a $500 off compared to other families. When we could have had hazardous roads put in, we could have got reimbursed by the state and charged them. So I, I'm confused at that whole logistics. But anyways, I do want to remind everybody that aid in lieu is 1,165, right? So we are undercharging already. We know that we're undercharging for the seats on the bus. So what I'm trying to say is we can go around and around in numbers, but I really think the district needs to decide that and then recommend to us. And then we say yes or no, but again, right? Like this, this will bring in revenue, but it's at a loss to what we're paying for the bus route. Right? So we could possibly be busing less students next year, getting a little more maybe in revenue, but we're going to be spending the same amount, right? So it, it's not like we're, <laughs> we're gaining some. Okay. Some so I just, thing. I just don't, I, so I'll be honest again, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves without really having the data, right? The, I understand the aid and loo number. I also want to, you know, say if we as a district believe that the busing is a service that we provide, then Maybe it is, you know, at a little bit of a loss or maybe at cost at best, right? We are not trying to make money off of providing the bus service to the students because mm -hmm. like it, we are not a for profit company. It's not, it's not like we're not trying to make money off. Okay, we'll give you a bus and we're going to charge you, you know, 1100 or 1200, whatever the number is. This is a service for the convenience, for the safety, among many other things. So, you know, just being cognizant of that. May I suggest if if there is if there is clarity needed on how much we are going to price, maybe Mr. Nixon go back and look at the data, and we look at what was done previously from precedent during redistricting, and maybe suggest a special board meeting. Like we can announce it, we can pick a date, we can pick a date next Thursday, come back with data, and then finalize the numbers and everything. If you need it sooner, then Mr. Nixon can come back to us and say, "Well, I need a meeting." Monday. Fine. We are all open to that. Mrs. Sheehan does need to move forward with, with some of this planning and does need a number to base that on. So can I, I'm going to recommend she moves forward with the pricing that we've been using and, and based upon some of the feedback that we're getting, if we need to revisit that, we can revisit that in another meeting. Can you, uh, can the messaging be that at this current point, because we haven't looked at all the data, it's going to be $1,000, but if the board determines that this can be offered at a lesser rate, then that will be updated by May 7th. I think we can definitely update the number by May 7th. What? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Max. So, so move forward with 1,000 as a max. As a max. the board can look at it and revisit it later then. Yeah, based on historical precedent and everything, we can come up with a firm number at the next regular board meeting. Mrs. Kana, you made the motion. Would you like to go back? Hold on. What motion are we talking about? The second motion? I don't no, think there was there no motion. Don't have motion. another motion? No. Okay. No, no. So there's just one motion. Yeah. That is just the motion that okay. we talked through. Yes. All right. <laughs> Mr. Nixon, do you have enough information to provide Mrs. Sheehan with guidance? Yes. Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nay. Who's second? Opposed. Okay. Adjourning at 11.07. <laughs>